This video is a recording of a ham radio class that I helped to organize and teach at the Trenton Computer Festival 2021. We called the class Ham Cram, and it was a couple of hour review of all the materials that are necessary in order to pass the technician class uh, amateur radio test in the United States. Of course, a couple of hours is not enough time to completely teach all of the material. The class is intended to be a review so that students can get a better feeling for which topics they are comfortable with and which they need more help with. And then we followed the class with some Q&A to help clarify those things and get them prepared to take tests later that day to obtain their licenses. The materials in this class are borrowed pretty heavily from the KP6NU No-Nonsense Technician Class Study Guide. You can find a link to that in the video description down below, as well as a link to the Trenton Computer Festival uh, website itself where you can actually check out some of the other classes that were taught that day. Now, while some people may not like the idea of simply studying the materials to pass a test because you don't really learn the material, I generally agree with that. However, in this case, the way I view amateur radio, it's kind of a lifelong hobby. So getting the license is really your first step to learning. So in some sense, we can call this your ticket to start learning. So whether you uh, really learn the materials up front and get very proficient at it before you take your test, or you learn enough to pass the test and let that begin your learning journey, either way is fine with me. So please join me along with my co-presenters, Pat Howard, K2PAT, and Joe Zaroff, WA3NEQ, and let's go and review the amateur radio class materials. Keep in mind that all these materials were derived from the uh, question pool dated from 2018 to 2022. Now, of course, this video will likely be up online past 2022. The basic concepts that are presented really aren't going to change. The specific wording of questions and maybe a couple of new topics may be added with the new question pool that comes out after 2022, but the bulk of this material will certainly be applicable. Sit back and enjoy the class. And thanks for watching. As, I, as was mentioned in the, the documents or the information on the, the TCF website, um, there isn't really time to teach all of this material in the time that we have. We're really reviewing the material, so I hope that you had a chance to do some pre-study on your own uh, before we go through here. But the idea here is to uh, run through the material, review it all, so that you can identify those things that um, that maybe uh, you know you have a question on uh, that we can address later on. I'll ask if you're if uh, if you're not one of the speakers, please mute yourself. So this is our agenda. These are the materials we're going to cover. Um, as, as really comes right out of the license manual, and again comes out of the KB6NU uh, study guide that was mentioned early on. Uh, but these are the materials that we'll cover here. I'll, I'm going to be starting off here, then Pat will pick up in, uh, in the middle, and then uh, Joe will pick up at the tail end here. So real quick, you know, what is amateur radio? You know, it's a hobby, absolutely. It's a service, uh, absolutely. And it's fun. <laughs> That's why we're all here. And it's really what you make of it. Uh, everybody gets a little something different out of it. And I think uh, you'll find the same thing for you as well. So it's a way to communicate, experiment, serve, interact, and compete, really. Um, so it is regulated, but it's not commercial. I mean, you, you can't use it for commercial app, you know, applications like taxi services and things like that, can't use it. Experimentation is allowed and actually encouraged. You, you know, build your own equipment and things like that. It's one of the things that I enjoy actually about the hobby, but it's not, that may not be in everybody's uh, ball of wax. Uh, community service. Uh, oftentimes, ham radio clubs will provide communications for things like bike races and boat races and things like that. And certainly uh, for uh, and under emergency situations is another area. Technical learning and discovery. Uh, and there's even ways to compete. There's uh, amateur radio contests that run that. Uh, so if you're a co competitive type person, there's ways to compete as well. So that might be uh, your cup of tea. So there really is something for everybody. So a lot of cool things to do, everything from talking through amateur radio satellites and talking to astronauts, to radio control, to just uh, rag chewing with people and talking with people, building equipment and things like that. So uh, you can find those things that, uh, that you like and, uh, and apply them to, to the hobby. 
So the first thing, first concept we're going to talk about are the electrical principles that you'll need to know to pass the exam. And again, we're not going to be teaching uh, the materials here, and this is just enough to get you familiar with the terminology if you're not familiar with it and understand you know, the basic concepts so that you can go ahead and pass the exam. The first concept we'll talk about is voltage. Okay, Voltage is kind of like the force that push, pushes electrons around. Now, Anytime in any of these slides where you see something either bold or italicized, it means these are words that appear in test questions. <laughs> okay, so just make it easy to, you know, voltage and force are things that you might want to put together. Okay, it's also called electromotive force, EMF, as another name for voltage. Okay, it's called the electromotive force. And it's measured in a unit called volts. And it's measured with a voltmeter. Okay, there might be a question that says, how do you measure the voltage? Well, it's a voltmeter. Okay, the symbol is E, standing for electromotive force. The symbol for voltage is E, but the unit symbol is volts. So like 120 volts, 12 volts, it'll be like 12 V or 120 V. But when we look, use it in a formula, the symbol for voltage is E. And another question might ask, but a typical mobile radio requires 12 volts to operate, like a car battery. The reality is it's 13.8, but the exam says 12 volts. <laughs> okay, so that's what it is, okay. Current, uh, that's the other aspect of electricity that we'll talk about. And the current is the flow of electrons in a circuit, okay, italicized, that might be an, an exam question, okay. It's measured in the units of amperes or amps, okay. The symbol for it is I, so when you see it in a formula, the symbol is I, but the unit symbol is A. So if you say there's three amps flowing, it'd be three A is three amps, okay. It's measured with an ammeter, Okay, so it's like amp meter, but without the P. DC stands for direct current, meaning the current flows in one direction, like you know, from you know, in a battery type situation. AC is alternating current, where the current flows back and forth, changing direction on a regular basis. And that's typically what comes out of your wall outlet is 120 volts AC, stands for alternating current. Okay, so it looks like something popped up in the chat here. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, thank you, Pat, or thank you, John. So, okay, so uh, let's see. Alternate, let me go back up here. So alternating current again uh, is AC. The frequency is the number of times per second that the alternating current makes a complete cycle. Okay, so going from positive to negative and back to, back to zero again, that's one cycle. How, how many times a second that happens, that's called the frequency of the alternating current. Okay, and the unit for that is Hertz. So in, in the US, our line power is 60 Hertz or 60 cycles per second. Okay, resistance is the, th the third element of electronics. We're, we talked about voltage being the force. We talked about current being the flow of electrons. Resistance is the, op the opposition to the flow of electrons. Higher resistance means a, a smaller amount of current. You can think of it as like, a, you know, a, the turning, a, shutting a valve on water or, or, or squeezing a pipe to restrict the flow of water. Okay, if you think about the water as the flow of electrons. It's measured in a unit called ohms. And the symbol is R for resistance. The, the unit symbol is the Greek omega symbol. Okay, and it's measured with an ohmmeter. So uh, we talk about electricity, we'll talk about conductors and insulators, right? Conductors offer very low resistance. They allow current to flow. Copper, aluminum, gold, silver, any type of metal typically is a very good conductor, okay? Insulators offer very high resistance with very little or no current flow. So plastic, wood, glass, mica, paper are all examples of insulators. So when you pick up a, you know, a wire, you pick up the wire that leads to your lamp, it's typically a plastic you know, coating on the wire. So you're not touching the wires. That's why you don't get electrocuted when you plug your lamp in, right? Because you're actually touching the insulator, okay? So uh, if you put all these things together, we can talk about power. Power is the rate at which electrical energy is used, okay? It's measured in watts. So like a 100 watt light bulb, for example, that's the power of that light bulb. The symbol is P for power, and the unit symbol is W for watts, okay? And it's often me me not measured directly, but calculated. And we'll, we'll talk more about this in the next slide or two, okay? So 
We can relate all these terms together with something called Ohm's law. Ohm's law relates voltage, E, current, I, and resistance. And it, this, this little uh, pie-shaped symbol is something that you ought to write down. Because when you get your scratch paper to do your test, write this down. It's a handy little hint to help you with the formulas. Because it shows you the relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. All right, And the, the relationship is such that the voltage is equal to the current times the resistance. Okay, so if you have a current, uh, you have a known amount of current flowing through a resistor, the voltage across that resistor can be calculated by the product of those. The current is the, and you can just rearrange this formula to say the current is equal to voltage divided by resistance, or the resistance is equal to voltage divided by current. Now, rather than remember all three of these formulas, if you write down this, this simple little thing, E over IR, what you do is with your hand, cover up the quantity you're looking to calculate. For example, if I want to calculate E, I cover it up and I'm left with I times R. They're right next to each other. If I want to calculate R, the resistance, I cover that up and I'm left with E over R, right? E divided by R, actually E divided by I or E voltage divided by current. So this simple little thing, it makes it very easy for you to remember these three formulas by just writing this one thing down. Just cover up the quantity you're trying to calculate and you're left with the formula to calculate it. Tom? Yes. One little hint I found that helps people remember what I is, I is the intensity of the current flow. Right. I yeah, believe that, that yeah, it that's comes where from, it came from. Yeah, it came from the French word intensity uh, for current. That's why, unfortunately, it's not C for current because we use C for capacitance. So, but uh, that's where that came from. Thank you, Pat. So a couple of examples, and these are examples that are sp specific questions. You may not get these questions on your exam, but this, just, this is how they're worded. So we have 90 volts applied across a resistor resulting in three amps of current. So I know the voltage, I know the current, I wanna calculate the resistance, right? So I cover up R, I get 90 volts divided by three amps, and that gives me 30 ohms. Same thing, 12 volts applied to a circuit with eight ohms of resistance. Now I know the voltage and the resistance, I wanna calculate current. Right, so e over, e over R and calculate the current. Two amps flowing through a 10 ohm resistor. What's the voltage that appears across that? And that's by cover up voltage. I multiply those two together. And keep in mind that the these are all multiple choice tests. The the other answers in the multiple choice test will be if you apply the formulas wrong. <laughs> so if you added something, subtracted something, or you multiply instead of divided, oftentimes that's what the wrong answers will be. So just uh, again, if you've got this written down, that's very easy to figure out which formula you need. So let's talk about series and parallel circuits. A series circuit is when the devices are really connected end to end, like these two resistors are connected in series, right? And a parallel circuit is when the devices are next to each other, okay? They're both you know, kind of connected, you know, you know, essentially in parallel like a railroad track, okay? In series circuits, there's only one path for current to flow, right? Current is gonna flow on the wires. It only has one way to go. It's gonna go through everything. So the current is the same through all of the components, right? I've got one fixed current that flows through all of those components and is unchanged at the component junctions, okay? Again, these italicized words because these are words that might appear in your exam questions. The voltage across each component in this is going to be determined by the type and value of these components. So the voltage appearing across R1 and the voltage appearing across R2 are going to depend on those resistor values and the voltage. Okay. So the sum of the voltages across the components equals the voltage source. So I got a voltage source, say this is a battery here. The voltage across R1 plus the voltage across R2 will be equal to that battery voltage. So for parallel circuits like this, each component is connected to the voltage source directly. Like I can see resistor one has got a direct connection to this battery. Resistor two has got a direct connection to the battery. Okay. The voltage then across each component is the same, right? Because I got the same wire connected top and bottom here, but the current divides between the junctions. So I've got a total current that's coming out of the battery and it's gonna divide. Some of it's gonna go through R1, some through R2 and then collect up at the other end. So the current depends on the component values. And the sum of the currents in each of those branches equals the total current and the circuit from the source. Okay. 
So for calculating power, we've got a similar little mnemonic. Not, and you can almost think of it as, as a pie chart, right? PIE, power, current, and voltage. And you have the same type of equations here. So the formulas work the same way. So very similar to Ohm's law, where we have E I R, we've got P I E for power. So the power is equal to the product of the voltage and the current, and then you can rearrange formulas the other way. So here's a couple of example questions that you might see uh, for power. One is, you know, how much power is being drawn or being used by a circuit that draws 10 amps from a 13.8 volt source? So we're looking for the power value, right? So I cover up P, I'm left with voltage times current. So I multiply those two together, get 138 watts. Okay. Now, if I've got an applied voltage is 12 volts and the current is two and a half amps, what's the power? Well, same thing again, I'm looking for power. So I'm gonna do the product. I got a 12 volt uh, circuit and 120 watts is being consumed. What's the current, All right? So I'm looking for the current. So I cover up I, I get P over R, excuse me, the power divided by the voltage and I get 10 amps, okay? So these are some, this is the way the questions would appear for those that you would have in the process, in the exams, okay? So let's talk about some of the math for electronics. Uh, we'll, let's start with prefixes. We use a lot of prefixes in math because we deal with some very large and very small quantities. So the, the, the prefix milli stands for one one thousandth of something, okay? So when we say one milliamp, that's one one thousandth of an amp. Okay, it can be written out in decimal like 0 0.001 amps. That's equivalent to one milliamp, okay? Micro is just one one millionth of something. So something like three micro volts is equal to 0 0.0000003 volts, right? Or three millionths of a volt, okay? Pico is one trillionth of something, okay? A millionth of a millionth, all right? such as, you know, five picoamps would be 0 0.00005 microamps, right? I didn't want to do all the zeros for pico, okay? But uh, you, so milli, micro, and pico, one one thousandth, one one millionth, one millionth of a millionth or a trillion, okay? Going the other way, when we do multiplications, uh, we'll have kilo, very common one that you see, uh, is uh, multiplying by a thousand. So one kilovolt is the same thing as a thousand volts. Mega stands for a million times. Okay, so like one mega ohms is the same as one million ohms. And giga is one billion times, okay, such as 2.4 gigahertz, 2.4 billion cycles per second. Okay, like if your, your Wi Fi operates at 2.4 gigahertz. Okay. The prefixes are often used because on different electrical quantities, like it could be for frequency, it could be for voltage, current, resistance, et cetera. Okay, so a couple of examples. So 1,500 milliamps, okay, is the same thing as 1.5 amps, right? Because I could divide that by 1,000, okay, 1.5 amps. 1,000 volts is a kilovolt, right? One millionth of a volt is a microvolt. And 3000 milliamps is the same thing as three amps. Okay, a couple of bonus questions here. Okay, so 3500 kilohertz is the same thing as 3.5 megahertz, right? Because this is multiplying by a thousand, that's multiplying by a million. The difference between those is another thousand, right? So I can divide by a thousand to get there. Okay, so it's just move the decimal point, you know, three, you know, three places one way or the other. 2,425 2, megahertz is the same thing as 2.425 gigahertz, okay? Because again, the difference of a thousand between those two, you know, a mega and a giga, okay? But there'll typically just be one or two questions on these prefixes, so it's good to be familiar with them. So another concept that's a little bit harder to understand sometimes is decibels or dB. It's, it's simply written with a small, small d, a big b. And when we're dealing with ratios, often power ratios, we use decibels. Uh, and, and because it's easy to express very large ratios with relatively small numbers. Okay? And when we cascade ratios, like if we say, well, I'm gonna multiply, this circuit's gonna multiply the signal by 10, that's gonna multiply it by 20. If I put them together, I gotta to multiply those things together. Um, cascading ratios, we gotta multiply or divide, and that can be ugly. 
with when we cast when we cascade things in decibels, we add or subtract. So we turn multiplication and division problems into addition and subtraction problems. That's one thing nice about dBs. A positive dB value represents an increase, like something is getting five times larger, 10 times larger, for example. A negative dB means you have a decrease, like something is going is getting, you know, it's, it's half as big. It's like divided by two or divided by 10. That would be represented by a negative dB number. And it's just a couple that you'll, you'll need to remember for uh, maybe a question or two on the exam. A three dB change is a factor of two. Okay, so changing from five watts to 10 watts is a three dB increase, okay, in power. It's a ratio of two to one. So three dB is a ratio of two to one. Six dB is a factor of four. Okay, it's like a four to one change. So a change from 12 watts to three watts is a six dB decrease, or therefore a minus six dB change, again, a ratio of four to one. And then the easy one to remember is 10 dB is a factor of 10. So increasing from 20 watts to 200 watts is a 10 dB increase, right? Ratio of 10 to one. These are the ones that you wanna remember because these are the ones that you may have a question or two. And the nice thing is they kind of add up, okay? So you can see that if I just take 3 dB plus 3 dB, that gives me 6 dB. And the same thing as 2 times 2 for 4, OK? So combination of dB values add and subtract. So say a 13 dB change is a factor of 20, right? Because it's a factor of 10. So it's 1 and 3. So it's a factor of 10 times 2. OK, that's why it's a 20x. All right, so with that, um, we'll, we'll uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about some electronic principles and components. So the first component we'll talk about is something called a resistor. Resistors oppose the flow of current. Okay, it's kind of like squeezing the pipe like we talked about earlier, okay? There are variable resistors. They typically have three terminals and have a knob like volume control on your radio, things like that. They're, all, they're called potentiometers or sometimes called rheostats. I'm showing these schematic symbols for these things as well as what it physically looks like. You might only see this shaft protruding through your equipment. The rest of this is what's sitting behind the panel, okay? A resistor's value is expressed in ohms that we talked about earlier, okay? Capacitors, these are some of the symbols for capacitors. These are what they physically look like. Capacitors are quite simply just two conductors separated by an insulator. Okay, we might say, well, what, what good is that, right? <laughs> that, that, you know, it's gonna block any current that's flowing, right? Well, the truth is that it blocks DC, but it actually does some interesting things for AC, okay? But it's two conductors separated by an insulator, that's a capacitor, okay? A capacitor stores energy in an electric field. So if I apply a DC voltage to a capacitor, it actually stores charge on those plates in what's called an electric field, okay? And again, these are questions, these, these words might be included in a question about uh, these components. And the capacitance is the ability to store energy in an electric field, okay? And the unit of capacitance, the measurement of it is called a farad. And oftentimes like a one farad capacitor would be a very huge capacitor. Oftentimes we're dealing with capacitors that are in the microfarads or picofarads you know, type of, of component values. But if the unit of measure is called a farad. Inductors are kind of the opposite of, of capacitors. As and an inductor stores energy in a magnetic field, all right? And it's often just a coil of wire. These are some examples of what inductors look like, all right? From a DC standpoint, it just looks like a wire. But for AC, it actually provides some interesting, uh, interesting characteristics. These are some of the symbols that you might see in a schematic for uh, an inductor. And the ability to store energy in a magnetic field is called inductance. Okay, that's an inductor has inductance. And the unit of measure is called the Henry. Okay, so uh, and often, again, oftentimes we're dealing with relatively smaller values of Henry, num smaller numbers of Henry's. So we're talking about micro Henry's or milli Henry's typically when we're talking about actual component values. So other switch, other components, switches are pretty easy to understand and the symbols are almost self-explanatory. They're used to connect or disconnect electrical circuits, okay? The pole is the movable part. Think about like this, this symbol here for a switch. I can see this looks like a little, looks like an open door. 
and that's the movable part that you're going to close. If you push that down so it touches the other side, that actually closes the switch or it opens it. So that movable part is called a pole because you can have switches with more than one pole that switch more than one circuit at a time. The throw is the number of places that that pole, that, that pole can go. So in this case, a single pole, single throw, I got a single pole that can only, can only go one place or connect to one place. This guy here is a single pole double throw. This would allow me to connect a circuit, to connect a, a circuit this way or that way, single pole double throw. And then you could keep adding on. Here's a double pole, double pole, double pole, double throw, double pole, single throw, et cetera. So again, the single pole, single throw, double pole, double throw kind of shows them here. Just gives you some options in terms of how these switches can be configured. Mm -hmm. So fuses are something else you'll find in equipment. Um, this is physically what they look like. You might see some of these style fuses and some older equipment. These are typical fuses that you might find in your car, for example. That's the electrical symbol. A fuse protects the circuit from overload, primarily basically in terms of excessive, excessive current. If something goes wrong with the circuit, it draws too much current. The fuse will melt, open up, and then essentially be like a permanently open switch at that point to protect the, the uh, piece of equipment. They're rated in amps, like how many amps can, will this fuse allow to pass? And if you exceed that, the fuse blows, okay? Uh, batteries, this is the typical symbol for a battery. The longer terminal is the positive terminal, okay? The shorter terminal is a negative one, like something took somebody away. So that's why I kind of remember that. Obviously, we all know what batteries look like. Primary batteries are not rechargeable. Typically, like the old carbon zinc batteries or alkaline batteries, you use them once, you throw them away. They're called primary batteries. Secondary batteries are rechargeable. And these are your, your nickel cadmium, nickel cadmium or NICAD batteries or nickel metal hydride, the NIMH. And now we also see now some newer ones, some lithium ion batteries and some called LIFEPO batteries. There are other uh, chemistries that are involved. There's a lot of different chemistries for secondary batteries, even the lead acid battery that's in your car, that's a secondary battery, it's rechargeable. The different types have different voltages. As you know, like a little, you know, alkaline bat, one and a half volt alkaline batteries at 1.5 volts. A NICAD battery is typically 1.2 volts. Okay, and other, other batteries will have different uh, typical voltages. So another component uh, in electro electronics are something called diodes. Okay, and there's a number of different symbols for diodes for different variations. Many of us might be familiar with a light emitting diode, right? Some, you know, most of the visual indicators on equipment these days are LEDs or light emitting diodes. It's just a diode with arrows coming off of it, okay? One of the properties of most diodes is that it allows current to flow only in one direction, okay? And the terminals are called the anode and the cathode. The anode is the one that looks a little bit like the size letter A. Okay, you can think about it that way. And the cathode is the bar. Okay. The cathode is the one typically on the, on the when you look at the physical component, is the one that's got the stripe on the end. Okay. It's often called a rectifier, right? It only allows current to go in one direction. Okay, so it rectifies the current. It can only, the current tries to go the other way, it blocks it. So it looks like a short circuit in one direction, an open circuit in the other. Okay. LEDs are light emitting diodes. You, sometimes you see them in displays or just uh, you might just see the a portion of this sticking through the panel of your device. It's a diode that creates light when uh, creates light when current passes through it. And it's current commonly used as a visual indicator. Again, these are things that might be there might be a question or two on your exam about that. Okay. So let's talk about now the transistors. We start talking about what we call active components now. A transistor is a component where the current flow is controlled by another current or voltage. So you can see there's three terminals here. Okay, so we might say that the current flowing from one terminal to another is gonna be controlled by a third. So you can almost think of it as an electronic valve or a gate, okay? It's often used as a switch to turn things on or off or an amplifier, okay? Where a small change on one pin can create a big change on the others, okay? Gain is a term that's used to measure, quantify, the, or to the, the measure of the ability to amplify, right? How much gain does a transistor have? Well, it, oftentimes how much gain does a transistor circuit have? And it's the ratio of the input to the output 
current, for example, or might be ratio of input to output voltage is a measure of gain, how much bigger you know, the output is compared to the input. Some transistor types. There are called bipolar transistors. Bipolar transistors are made of three layers, okay, of semiconductor material. There are two basic types of semiconductor material, an N-type and a P-type. And uh, the bipolar transistors, bipolar transistors can either be PN or PNP. These are the symbols for those. Okay, NPN. Um, and the way I try to remember it is if you look at the symbol for a bipolar transistor, the arrow always points to the N material. Okay, so if I've got a PNP, this is PNP. So the base is the N material, the arrow is pointing to the N. For an NPN, collector base emitter, NPN, the arrow is pointing to the N or the emitter. Okay, so those are the symbols for bipolar transistors. Okay, again, the terminals are base, collector, and emitter for a bipolar transistor. Oops. Uh, and they're typically referred to uh, in this fashion oh. as to what they look like. Is there a question? Okay. Some other transistor types. There's another transistor type called a field effect transistor. Okay, it's abbreviated as FET. Okay, the current through the transistor is controlled by the voltage on the gate. So the voltage on the gate determines the current flowing from drain to source. Okay, the terminals are gate, drain, and source. Oops. Uh, again, these, there are various types of, um, of FETs. They'll have different symbols, but they all are kind of common in the sense that Typically, they, they sent the, 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 just like the bipolar transistor, there's, there's a center kind of vertical bar, but the typically the uh, drain and source come off at right angles and down, whereas on the bipolar transistors, they come off at angles. That's how you kind of see the difference between an FET symbol versus a bipolar junction, a bipolar transistor. Okay. Gate drain and source again are the terminals on an FET. And that's all you really need to know for the exam. So, so far we've been talking a lot about schematic symbols. I've shown a number of them uh, as we talked about some of these components. So a symbol for a diode, a capacitor, an inductor, and a resistor as, as typically what they look like. And a schematic diagram depicts the interconnections between components that make up a circuit. Again, this is one of the questions that's on an exam. What is a schematic diagram? That's what it is, okay? And this is an example of what a schematic diagram looks like. I can see I've got a diode, a capacitor, a PNP transistor, a resistor here, et cetera, okay? There are lots of different symbols. Um, you know, some of these you just have to memorize if you're not familiar with them, but a lot of them are just variations, like here's capacitors. Your basic capacitor, sometimes it's shown with a curved line, sometimes it's straight. Don't really have to worry about why at this point. Anytime you have any kind of a component with an arrow going through it, that means that that component, its value is variable. Like here's a variable capacitor or a variable resistor, okay? A variable inductor, okay? And then we've shown some of the uh, transistor uh, symbols here as well, okay? So, there will be, there might be one or two exam questions that actually show a schematic like this. And it might ask you, what is, you know, this component or what is that component? Okay. So here's an example of what you might see. Okay. Here's a simple, a very simple little circuit here. And they would say, okay, number, component number one, what is that? It's a resistor used to limit the input current. Okay. Component number two, that's a transistor. In this case, it's being used as a switch to turn on this light bulb. Okay, number three is a light bulb or a lamp, and four is the battery, okay? And five is the symbol for chassis ground. Typically any piece of equipment, you know, if there's a metal housing, that's called the chassis. Oftentimes one side of the power supply is usually connected to that chassis ground. Okay. Another example, here's a simple AC to DC power supply. Got the AC line coming in, going through a fuse and a switch. So there's a fuse. There's a single pole, single throw switch to turn power on through this guy, which is a transformer. Okay, the transformer is used to take the 120 volts coming from our line and turn it to a lower voltage AC, okay, at the output. Uh, symbol number five is a rectifier diode, take the AC voltage we got coming out of the transformer, turning it into essentially pulsating DC, 
the capacitor is going to be used to filter that. And then we've got an LED here that's as a pilot light that tells us that the power supply is on. And there's a variable resistor to control how much current is flowing through uh, that last component, which is a Zener diode. Okay. Uh, one more example. Here's a, a simple output circuit of a, of a transmitter, for example. There's a variable inductor, that's symbol number three. The variable capacitors here, they might be used together with the inductor to create a tuned circuit. Okay. And then symbol number four is an antenna. So a couple of other components you might run across on, uh, in an exam question here. Um, a relay. A relay is a switch that's controlled by an electromagnet. So it's a switch that you don't control directly, but you is controlled kind of like um, your doorbell, for example, it uses a relay oftentimes, okay? A meter, it's used to display an electrical quantity on a numeric scale to actually measure voltage or current, for example, you often use a meter for that. A shielded wire, a shielded wire is a, a type of wire that prevents unwanted coupling from one wire to another, okay? So the name kind of implies that. A regulator or a voltage regulator controls the amount of voltage from a power supply. So you might see a question on a regulator, okay? Or an integrated circuit. So this, an integrated circuit is a component that combines many, many parts into one package to perform a more complex function. Like a microcontroller or a microprocessor in your computer is an integrated circuit. Whereas a, a diode or resistor capacitor is a single component. You know, a, micro, a microprocessor might contain hundreds of thousands or millions of parts in one package. It's called an integrated circuit. So with that, uh, that's kind of all the electrical principles and properties. Um, maybe we'll take a quick little pause. I'll take a quick look and see if anything popped up here in chat. I'm not sure if it did. Hold on a minute. Let's kind of pop that up here. Okay, so no, no questions in the chat. Um, with that, uh, we'll move on to, uh, to some radio properties. So radio waves are what are called electromagnetic waves. Okay, electromagnetic waves, um, again, just the name of it. Uh, they have an electric and magnetic field components. They, they actually have different orientations in space if you could see them, but, uh, but they, all you need to know is that electromagnetic waves have electric and magnetic field components. And radio waves travel through space um, and carry signals from transmitters to receivers. That's really what they are. Okay, you just can't see them, but they're there. So let's talk about frequency and wavelength. We talked a little bit about frequency before. Again, frequency is the number of times per second that the cycle repeats. Now the exam might say the number of times the signal reverses, which really technically isn't true. It was written wrong. They may have corrected that, but it might say the number of times it reverses, but actually the signal reverses twice in one cycle. But even though they say reverses, they're, they really mean repeats. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So frequency is measured in Hertz. Hertz stands for cycles per second. So, so how many times we kind of start back at the beginning again, we're showing two cycles in this particular diagram. How many times that repeats per second is the frequency measured in Hertz. And the wavelength is how far that wave travels during one cycle. Think about radio waves in free space, they travel at the speed of light, right? So how, if you're, depending on how fast that you're moving back and forth, that will determine the wavelength or how far one cycle travels before this next cycle repeats itself. So the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. So a couple more radio wave facts. Okay, again, tra they travel at the speed of light in free space. That's about 300 million meters per second. Okay, so it might be a question on that. Okay, and that's regardless of frequency, whether we're talking about you know, signals at you know, 770 kilohertz, like your AM broadcast radio, or you know, 100, you know, 104.3 megahertz on your FM radio, those radio waves travel at the same speed and speed of light through free space, okay? The wavelength is shorter as the frequency increases, okay? So higher frequency, shorter wavelength. And the wavelength in meters is equal to this simple formula. If you take 300 divided by the frequency expressed in megahertz, okay? So if I had a 100 megahertz signal, right? 300 divided by 100 megahertz would be three. So its wavelength would be three meters. 
So we talk about uh, radio frequencies, we group them in bands. It's a convenient way to talk about a, a group or a, a family of radio frequencies that might behave somewhat the same in terms of propagation. And the approximate wavelength of the radio waves is used to identify different bands. And we do this oftentimes in ham radio, we'll talk about different bands by their wavelength. For example, the two meter band used in ham radio spans 144 to 148 megahertz. Well, you might say, well, 300 divided by 144 isn't exactly two, right? It would be 300 divided by 150 would be two. Well, we actually, we just round this stuff off. So it's approximate, okay? So just keep that in mind as well, okay? The 40 meter band spans from seven to 7.3 megahertz, okay? Again, it's not exactly 40, but it, that's the closest kind of rounded number. And that's just, just what we do in ham radio. So we don't, we don't go explicitly to, oh, it's the 2.732 meter band. Even though that's precisely correct, we just kind of refer to that as the two meter band, for example, okay? So again, not always exact, so just keep that in mind. So we talk about the RF spectrum. We can talk about, um, you know, RF is obviously radio frequency. The full range of frequencies are divided up into sub ranges just for convenience. And they're given these names here. The most common for amateur radio are HF, stands for high frequency. Okay, and that's from three to 30 megahertz is HF, okay. VHF, for very high frequency. And you, if, if those guys, for those of us that are old enough to remember TVs with a dial on them, right? You had a VHF dial and a UHF dial, okay? That was because those are the frequencies that were being transmitted by the, the uh, TV stations, right? So VHF is, is between three and 30 megahertz. And we could see VHF TV was in there and FM radios in there. Shortwave radio is typically um, HF. And then UHF is ultra high frequency. 300 meg to three gigahertz or 300,000 megahertz, okay? And that's UHF. So UHF TV was in there, mobile phones are in there, all kinds of stuff is in there. Wi-Fi is all in UHF. And then there's others like super high frequency, extremely high frequency, and then medium, low, and very low, okay? But the ones you wanna worry about for amateur radio are these three. So, so each of these bands have some different properties. Okay, uh, in terms of propagation, in terms of how they travel. Okay, so there's different use cases for them. VHF and UHF, those higher frequencies, like very high frequency and ultra high frequency, are typically line of sight communications, meaning that not that you can visually see things, but that the radio waves themselves don't have to go around the earth. Okay, uh, so they're typically going to be shorter distance, you know, line of sight type communications where there's no obstacles or planets in the way of things, okay? So uh, not and they're not reflected off the ionosphere and they're rarely heard outside of a local area. So it's typically used for local communications, okay? The radio horizon is where the radio signal is blocked by the curvature of the earth, okay? Now you might say, well, okay, that's just a couple of miles out. The reality is there's a little bit of bending that happens. So the, the earth seems slightly left, less curved RF. It's not that, it, it's just the way that things are kind of uh, worded in the exam is that the, the radio horizon is just a little bit beyond the visible horizon because uh, radio waves tend to bend a little bit around the, um, the earth, but uh, not, a, not a tremendous amount, but there, there may be one question on that. So uh, if uh, you may have experienced something on your FM radio called multipath, and it typically happens with VHF and UHF because VHF and UHF signals are oftentimes reflected uh, off of ob objects. Okay, so, so signals that are reflected off of objects, for example, let's, let's say I've got a radio in my car, okay, and I'm receiving a signal from a transmitter, but that signal I'm getting directly from the transmitter, but I might also be getting it from you know, a reflection off of a mountain, reflection off of a building, or even a reflection off of an airplane or something like that. And if all these signals hit my antenna at the same time, they are all traveling a different distance. They might add up with each other, or they might actually cancel each other out, depending on the, what's called the phase of the signal. So sometimes if you, if you pull up to a light and all of a sudden the station you're listening to goes away, and you move up about three more feet and it comes back, it's all because of this multipath uh, type of thing that's going on. So if you're try if you're affected by multipath, try moving a couple of feet. You might you might fix it. And multipath can affect digital signals 
uh, and affect what's called their error rates. Again, there's one question on that that might show up. So multipath can affect digital signal error rates. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit more about signal reflections. Sometimes if you can't reach a VHF or UHF station, you might be able to direct your signal to, to reflect off of something. Like, like for example, if I want to you know, have this my, in my car, I actually want to talk to this satellite up here. Maybe this building's in the way. If I direct my antenna to reflect off of this building, I might actually be able to reach the satellite, for example. So sometimes reflections can be your friend, okay? So a multiple changing reflections due to being in a moving vehicle can cause rapid fading or fluctuation called picket fencing. Kind of like when you were a kid and you kind of yelled through a fan in the hallway and you could hear your voice get chopped up. The same kind of thing happens with multipath when you're moving. Sometimes you hear a rapid flickering in the FM radio station, for example. Okay, that can happen. So a little bit more on VHF and UHF. Uh, UHF is better at penetrating building structures than VHF is. So it's better suited for use inside or around buildings. So oftentimes uh, guys that are using business band radios in, inside of a building, they, they, the plumbers talking to each other, contractors and things like that, they're typically using radios that are running UHF frequencies, okay? You also can get something called knife edge diffraction. So if you've got a sharp object, like a sharp peak of a mountain, uh, sometimes little radio waves can kind of bend around that a little bit and diffract around that. Uh, so that so even though that might be a barrier to the line of sight between a transmitter and receiver, uh, you, this knife edge diffraction can sometimes work in your favor. Okay, and range is better in the VHF and UHF in the winter because you've got less leaves on the trees and you don't get the absorption by the vegetation with the leaves on the trees. So something else we'll talk about here is signal polarization, okay? So we've talked about, uh, remember the electromagnetic waves have got an electric field and a magnetic field component? Well, actually the orientation of an antenna will affect what's called the polarization, essentially how that field appears if you could, act, you could actually see it. And it's really important primarily for VHF and UHF. Vertical polarization is often used for things like repeaters, like uh, like your police and fire will, when they're talking on their radios, they're actually talking in through a repeater, which then sends their signal back out again. Those antennas are vertically oriented and therefore use what's called vertical polarization. Horizontal polarization is often used for weak signal operation, um, just because of the way the, the antennas are constructed, it's easier to get better propagation with horizontal antennas. And if, you do, if you're, if you're receiving antenna and your transmitting antenna don't have the same polarization, the signals will be much weaker. So if you have a you know a hand two handheld radios and you're talking with your buddy and one 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 of his your buddy's got his radio turned sideways so the antenna is horizontally polarized instead of vertically, the signal level will be not as strong. So you want to kind of keep the polarization the same in both cases if you can. So long distance VHF communications can happen with something called sporadic E. And this is a, the E layer in the atmosphere can sometimes get these clouds of ionization that can, call, that can reflect the radio signals. So we said most times VHF signals are just line of sight, but they can be reflected by these ionized clouds you know, that can happen every once in a while in the E layer. That's called sporadic E prop propagation. And that uh, might result in some very long distance communications beyond the horizon. And uh, typically on the lower VHF frequencies, like on 10 meters, six meters and two meters, which is the uh, 28 uh, megahertz band, the 50 megahertz band and the 150, 140 megahertz band. Okay. A little bit more long distance communications on VHF. Sometimes fog and rain will have little effect on 10 meter and six meter signals. Uh, but other long distance phenomena, these are not really in the exam, but I'll just mention them. Auroral uh, reflected signals, um, meteor scatter, tropospheric scatter, tropospheric ducting. Um, there used to be some questions on this. They may not be in the exam anymore, so. Now let's talk about HF frequencies. These are the three to 30 megahertz frequency ranges. These typically are, are reflected off the ionosphere. Okay, so these are the, so this is like shortwave radio, for example. Um, that's why you can hear, you know, Radio Moscow, for example, because they sit get reflected off the ionosphere above the surface of the earth. And that's what enables worldwide propagation of these radio signals. 
Okay, and again, this is primarily for HF. So you have the like the higher layers above the E layer, like the F layer and above is typically what we're talking about here. Okay. So fading is pretty common because the ionosphere kind of changes, you know, and uh, sometimes can cause good reflections or poor reflections. Okay. And uh, also polarization is not so important because the, the reflections kind of can tend to randomize or scramble, if you will, the polarization. You get these interesting things like, um, like I got somebody here in San Francisco, okay, might actually be able to talk to somebody in Chicago through this um, you know, reflection here, but somebody in Denver can't hear them. So it's not uncommon that to hear somebody say, oh, I can't really hear you, you're too close, <laughs> right? You're actually inside that skip zone. The radio wave is going right over you and coming back down somewhere else, like skipping a rock, you know, on the lake, for example. Okay, so there's a skip distance. Okay, sometimes you can get multiple hops, but you can say, well, I've got, I can talk to people really close and I can talk to people really far, but I can't talk to people in the middle. And that's pretty common in HF. It's also pretty common to only hear one side of a conversation because the guy, you might be hearing somebody that is, you know, in a, in a good place for you to hear over a skip, but the guy he's talking to might be too close to you. And so you can't hear him. So that's, that's pretty common. Okay. And you get these variations in the ionosphere. So it can be broken up in all these different layers. You get this aurora you know, type, of, you know, type of effects. You, know, um, you can get meteor scatter, things like that. But most of what we're talking about is in the F1 and F2 layers during the day. And they combine into one layer called the F layer at night. So higher bands like 10, 15, and 20 meters are typically better during the day when the sun is kind of energizing these higher F1 and F2 layers. The lower bands like 40 meters, 160 and uh, 80 meters are better at night with, when uh, the sun is, is gone and these F layers are collapsed down to a single F layer. Okay. And we also experience what's called an 11 year sunspot cycle. The sunspots affect the level of ionization in the, uh, in the atmosphere. And we're actually just on the cusp of the increase of the next solar cycle right now. So uh, over the next four or five years, we'll, we will see improving propagation conditions for HF communications because of the increased sunspot activity uh, from the sun. So at the peak of the 11 year solar cycle, six meter and 10 meter bands can provide long distance communications around the world. So. Uh, uh, but then, uh, and you can still sporadically get that, but uh, once when we're at the peak of these solar cycles, then all the bands really come alive. So let's talk a little bit about antennas and feed lines. Okay, so I've got pictured here, you know, coax leading up to a pair of wires, and this is called a dipole. Then that's the mo one of the most common and simplest antennas to use for, uh, for uh, especially HF, is a half wave dipole. So the length of the wire from one end to the other, including the break in the middle, is one half of a wavelength long. That's called a half wave dipole. They're typically horizontally polarized. When they're, if you mount them parallel to the earth, it, it will be a horizontally polarized antenna. And the radiation is broadside to the antenna. So like in this case, the radiation is coming right at you, not really off the ends of the antenna. So it's not where the antenna wire is pointed. <laughs> It's really off the broad sides of, uh, of the antennas where the, most of the radiation will occur. Okay, so some more details on a half wave dipole. It's typically about 5% shorter than the free space. You know, if we calculate that 300 divided by you know, the frequency in megahertz, you know, to get meters, the antenna is actually gonna be a little bit shorter than that uh, due to things like installation and other things like that. So for example, and this one it might be an exam question, a six meter, a dipole for the six meter band is typically 112 inches long. And uh, ideally uh, you cut them to a particular length to make the antenna what's called resonant, okay? Um, if, if the antenna is too long or too short, it may not work as well. You make it resonant on a particular frequency you wanna use and make it the most efficient. So if you wanna make an antenna resonant on a higher frequency, you'd shorten it, right? Because higher frequencies are shorter wavelengths, okay? Uh, we've talked about the formula for wavelength in, uh, in terms of free space, 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz. But here in the US, since we're talking about building antennas, we're often talking about feet and inches and not uh, in meters. So we'll use this formula here to calcul calculate the length of a half wave dipole, 468. Okay, easy numbers to remember, just counting by two. Four, six, eight divided by the frequency in megahertz gives you the overall length of the dipole in feet. 
Okay, and that's the overall half wavelength length. So obviously, if you take half of that, let me go back. So go. If you take half of that, it's two, three, four. Okay, would give you the length of each side. Okay. So you also see vertical antennas. Okay, there's a very short little vertical antenna has a couple of radials on the sides. The vertical antennas are typically built to be a quarter wavelength long. Okay, the and vertically polarized. Okay, because it's a vertical antenna. Uh, and for example, a two meter, or I should say, a vertical antenna for the two meter band is typically about 19 inches long. Again, okay. might be an exam question on that. Okay. So again, uh, the quarter wavelength, again, it's just half of that previous formula, two, three, four divided by a frequency, all right? If you, if you remember that as the quarter wavelength formula, it's easy to just double that to get the half wavelength formula for a dipole, okay? So high frequency antennas or HF antennas, they can be very long, right? Because HF could be as low as a couple of megahertz. So the wavelength, you know, like a, say in the 3.5 3 megahertz band, the wavelength is 160 meters long. So even a quarter wavelength antenna would be really tall or a half wavelength dipole would be half of that length or about half that length. So that's, that's a big antenna, okay? So lower frequencies, the antennas can be pretty big. But oftentimes they're what's called loading is often used to physically shorten an antenna. Like this case is showing a coil. It's called a loading coil. It's basically an inductor that's put in series with the radiating element to make it look electrically longer. So it's physically not as long, but it's electrically longer. So it, it helps you to shorten what would normally be a very big or very long antenna, okay? So inductors in series with the radiating elements, for example. Uh, so a loaded antenna is not as efficient as the full-size antenna, but it might actually be something that could fit on your property, okay? So we'll also talk about beam antennas. A beam antenna is often given that name because it's got a, you know, a, a long beam, okay, in it, okay? And it typically concentrates the energy in one, ideally in one direction, okay? A quad antenna uh, is something that's kind of pictured here, looks like a couple squares, four sides, hence the name quad. A Yagi antenna is this style of antenna. It looks like a, you know, a long beam with a bunch of elements on it. That's called a Yagi. Or a dish antenna. Everybody knows what a dish antenna looks like. These are all examples of directional antennas. Okay. And the gain of a directional antenna is the increase in signal strength in the direction of the antenna with respect to some reference antenna. It might be a dipole or something like that. So you might say that this Yagi has got 10 dB of gain with respect to a dipole. So it's 10 times, 10 times stronger signal than a dipole in that one direction. Okay. So um, we also refer to uh, these little antennas that are oftentimes on our handheld radios as rubber duck antennas, okay? Because they're just, they look like those little bits of, of rubber, but they actually have an antenna inside them, but we call them a rubber ducky antenna. They're flexible antennas on most handheld transceivers or HTs. Okay, so it's a lot more convenient to have something that's flexible than these fixed antennas that can poke you in the eye. Okay, disadvantage is that they're not, not as efficient as a full-size antenna because they're typically loaded, like they could maybe have a coil in them instead of, like we said, a two meter antenna, which is a common you know, handheld uh, frequency. That's a 19 inch long antenna. That's a pretty big antenna to be holding next to your head, right? So the, the antennas are typically physically shorter because of the loading, okay? And there's a good reason not to use them in a car because the signals will be much weaker as compared to being outside the vehicle, right? Because you're just surrounded by the metal of a car, it may not work as well, okay? So a properly mounted, say, five, waves and five wavelengths antenna provides a much lower radiation angle and more gain than a quarter wavelength antenna for mobile use. So again, just one question that might be appear about that. So the five wavelengths long antenna is going to provide more gain and a lower angle than a quarter wavelength antenna. So let's talk about feed lines. Feed lines are what we use to get signals to and from the radio and the antenna. Okay, so with handheld transceivers, there typically isn't any feed line, but if you've got a radio in your car, a radio in your house, and an antenna outside, feed line is what gets you there. Coaxial cable is often used because it's very easy to use, requires, but it does require a few special installation considerations. It's called a coaxial wire because it has essentially two wires that are on the same axis, if you will, one wire 
is the shield that's surrounding the center conductor. Okay, so it's typically called a shield and a conductor, but they both are essentially the, the two conductors that are part of that feed line. They're mainly used to carry RF between the radio and antenna. The loss in a cable uh, increases as the frequency increases. So you might have cable that if you use it at HF might only have a dB of loss, but at VHF or UHF might have five or 10 dB of loss. Okay, the higher the frequency, the more loss a cable will have. And the impedance of a feed line, okay, uh, ideally matches the impedance of the, of the transmitter and the antenna. Most coax that we're using has what's called a 50 ohm impedance. You don't really have to understand what that means, but just to know the terminology, okay? And ideally is that that matches the impedance, the output impedance of the, of the radio, as well as the input impedance of the antenna, okay? That would give you the most efficient power transfer from the, say, a transmitter to an antenna is when that impedance matches. And in most cases, again, for coaxial lines, the impedance is 50 ohms. So some common coax types. Uh, just go by these code numbers. RG58 and RG8 are the most common. And they basically just differ in physical diameter. The, the, the RG8 is going to have lower loss, but they're both 50 ohm cables. Okay, they're both 50 ohms. There's one might be physically larger than the other. The larger the cable, typically the lower the loss. So the RG58 is thinner, but higher loss on the RG8. Coax with the lowest loss for VHF and UHF is like an air insulated hard line. And that's these big fat wires that you see going up cell towers and things like that. What they look like inside is this. It might be, you know, it might be pretty large in diameter. You can see it from this guy holding it, how big this is. But air insulation or just a little spacer to kind of keep the center conductor and the outer conductor separated, those are the lowest loss air insulated hard lines. So what are common coaxial failure modes? One is moisture contamination, right? If you get any cracks in the insulating jacket, water can get in there and corrode the copper, okay? Or water can get in at where you have the connectors if you don't properly seal them, and that can corrode the copper. So the jacket or the outer insulator of the uh, coax, if it's gonna be used outside, needs to be UV resistant to, pre to prevent cracks and therefore prevent uh, water contamination. And air core coax requires special techniques to ensure that no water or moisture gets in of the, into where the air insulation is. Again, it's, it's properly sealing uh, where the connections are made primarily. Okay, so let's talk about RF connectors. What are the connectors that we're using at the end of the coax? So th these connectors shown here are what are called PL259. Okay, it's most common for HF frequency use. Okay, for three to 30 megahertz, the PL259. It's, it's often called a UHF connector, but it's not suitable for UHF, just a bad, bad name. But the technical name for it is a PL259. It's not suitable at higher frequencies. Okay, the end type connector, which is this one shown here, is typically most suitable for signals, you know, even below 400 megahertz, but certainly above 400 megahertz, the end connector is more efficient and more common. The PL259 is not suitable for those frequencies. Again, we have to take care to seal against any water intrusion, okay, to prevent uh, loss in the feed line and that type of thing. So we want to be sure to use a, a sealant of some sort, uh, like a sealing tape or something where the, where the connector connects to an antenna, for example. Okay. And you want to keep them tight. Loose connections can cause erratic SWR readings. We'll talk about what that means in a moment, but that's a, that could be an exam question. You want to make sure your RF connections are tight so you do not get erratic SWR readings. Again, we'll talk about that in a minute. So let's talk about what SWR is. SWR stands for standing wave ratio. Okay. And it's a measure of how well matched the load or an antenna, for example, is to the transmission line. Remember we said that we want the transmission line if it's 50 ohms, we also want the antenna to look like a 50 ohm impedance. When you have that good match, you're gonna have a very low SWR, okay? So, so what happens is if the, if the antenna or the load is not matched to the transmission line, you can actually have some energy reflected back. It's kind of like uh, if you, uh, it's kind of like if you see a wave coming in and hits a seawall, 
the, the seawall bounces that in, that wave back and you see the wave going in the opposite direction. That reflected energy is going, is going back because the wall doesn't absorb that energy, all right? So in the case of RF, if the antenna is matched to the feed line, it absorbs all the energy coming from the feed line and nothing gets reflected back. So if nothing's reflected back, you don't, you get a very good, very low SWR. Okay, so low SWR is needed with coaxial feed lines to get efficient power transfer and to minimize losses. Okay, and power that's lost in a feed line is converted to heat. Okay, so when, again, a question might ask, you know, something about, you know, if power's lost, you know, power's lost in a feed line in the, in the form of what? It might be heat and it might be a couple of other answers there, but that's a, a question that might appear on your exam. Okay. So how do we measure SWR? There's a bunch of different meters and things that can be used. So SWR is typically measured with an SWR meter. Uh, oftentimes it'll be called VSWR, okay? Or voltage standing wave ratio, okay? So um, the SWR meter is connected between the transmitter and the feed line, okay? Or the transmitter and the antenna or the feed line and the antenna, somewhere in that line, okay? Uh, you could also use something called a directional watt meter, and that's the that's this example here. A directional watt meter can measure power in both directions, the forward direction and the reverse direction, or therefore the forward power and the reflected power. Okay, and then you can from that calculate SWR, but the SWR meter will do it for you. So an SWR of one to one is considered a perfect match, or 1.0 to one is called a perfect match, meaning that all the energy is going to the load, nothing's getting reflected back. An SWR of two to one is where most solid state transmitters will enable their own protection circuits to cut their own power back to protect the output, the output amplifier, to protect the output transistors. Because any energy that's reflected back from the antenna goes back into the transmitter and gets dissipated in the transmitter and it may not like it. So most solid state and modern transmitters, if they see more than a two to one SWR, will start cutting their own power back as a self-protection measure, okay? An SWR of four to one is worse than, means there's a pretty large impedance mismatch. Mm -hmm. And these are some of the examples that might appear on some questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Was there a question I heard? Okay. And also you'll find that there's a, a instrument called an antenna tuner, often called a transmatch, that is used to match the antenna system impedance to the transmitter. So in the case where you don't have a perfect match, maybe because of the design of the antenna, or even just because you know, not all antennas have got a, a perfect match to the transmission line, it will use a what's called a transmatch or an antenna tuner to adjust the impedance that's seen by the transmitter, okay, and, and allow it to deliver full power into the now tuned antenna system. Okay, so a couple of more measurements. So there is a, an instrument called an antenna analyzer. There's actually a lot of different var varieties of these. An antenna analyzer is commonly used to measure SWR. So you don't even have to use your transmitter. You can just use the analyzer itself. It also can measure the antenna's resonant frequency, right, where it's matched the best. So that might give you some information about when you want to, you know, lengthen it or shorten it, for example, to make it match the frequency you want to use it on. It also can measure things like capacitance and inductance, you know, which are compo uh, component values. So there's also an a, a, a instrument called a dummy load. A dummy load is just a big 50 ohm resistor with uh, a lot of heat sinking capability. And what this allows you to do is to do some testing with your transmitter without radiating a signal out into the air. So if you want to tune up a transmitter, get a, the power adjusted right, things like that, you can, instead of connecting to your antenna, you connect up to the dummy load. It provides a non-inductive good load for the transmitter to throw its power into without putting the power in the air so you don't interfere with somebody. So it's the dummy load is a non-inductive resistor with a heat sink. Okay, again, these italicized terms might be terms that are in a question on your exam. All right, so we're starting on time. Uh, name is Pat, call sign is here on the shirt, K2 Pat. And it's my ARRL short sleeve shirt, unlike Alan's long sleeve shirt. So that's our uniforms when we're doing ham things.
not required, but eventually you'll you'll want the uh, the bling. All right, so Alan showed us how we got propagation, and we've got variable variable propagation depending on frequencies. So that's the radio signal. Now, what's on your radio signal? On your radio signal, we want to transfer information. That information gets transferred with modulation modes. How do we modulate the radio signal? The uh, original basic types were either uh, AM or FM. And of course, Morse code or CW was the original, the granddaddy of modulation. And that's just switched it on or off. Switch the signal on and off. So the modulation here represents a low frequency like a voice. The AM or FM modulation here, they represent some high frequencies or some very high frequencies like five megahertz or 10 megahertz or 150 megahertz. So the AM signals, they're not exactly to scale, but they shift the amplitude up and down with response to your voice. An FM signal keeps the amplitude steady, but squeezes the frequency in or out in, with respect to your voice. So that's frequency modulation, amplitude modulation, frequency modulation. What you'll see on some modern equipment, some modern transceivers or modern test equipment are the pictures below. The one below here is called a waterfall display. The waterfall display, if you move your cursor, the diamond to the signal you want to listen to, it's right here. So your red diamond over the green bar, that translates to text. You'll see the other half of this screen will show your conversation with someone else. Looking particularly at FM modulation. FM is frequency modulation. It's most common on VHF and UHF repeaters, which is where you will probably end up starting as a technician. It's also used for VHF packet radio transmissions. Packet radio is like text. It's one of our earliest versions of ham radio text after Morse code. And then we've got the AM modulation. The AM modulation shifts the amplitude. You've got the radio frequency, the carrier, the modulating wave, your voice. AM is one of the simplest modulation modes. You modulate the signal strength with your voice. And uh, when you do that, you will take up uh, the bandwidth as shown, the energy is present at the carrier frequency. That's the frequency in the center, in the lower diagram. That's the carrier frequency and side bands on both sides of the carrier. So when you modulate with AM, you take up twice the signal that you would uh, in your voice. You have a, a upper side band and a lower side band. You can cut out one of those sidebands and cut out the carrier. And that's called a single sideband. Single sideband is a form of amplitude modulation where it's concentrated in one sideband or the other. It gives you increased distance and it's used for weak signal contacts on VHF and UHF. For example, on a two meter sideband, you can talk from uh, from Philadelphia to Boston, at least in this neighborhood. And it would take several repeaters to do that on FM. So you can talk directly uh, using this weak signal mode 
in, in upper sideband or lower sideband. Now, most of the technician frequencies will use, the convention is to use upper sideband, USB. The advantage of SSB properties are it has a narrower bandwidth than FM. It's typically three kilohertz for single sideband versus five to 15 kilohertz if you were FM. And the picture below shows where your voice occupies. Your voice, your audio frequencies on the left might go from 300 to 3000 Hertz. This is a, uh, this is a convention that includes most voices, most usable characteristic of most voices. It might not be called high fidelity, but it's, uh, it's useful to standardize on uh, the amount of sideband you're gonna occupy. So when you put that over on the right, you modulate that on a carrier signal, you get an upper sideband and lower sideband. If you can take away the power you've wasted on a carrier, take away the power you've wasted on a lower sideband, concentrate it all on upper sideband, you take up less space, and the signal is more powerful. Now, one of the narrowest bandwidth, especially as, as far as the test is concerned, is Morse code at 150 Hertz. Not kilohertz, but Hertz. That is, <clears throat> that is very narrow. And of course it varies depending on how, how fast you're sending Morse code. The faster you send the Morse code, the more space you take. But its uh, nominal value is 150 Hertz. The Morse code we use is called international Morse code. That is something that would be uh, <clears throat> possibly on your test. CW can be sent three different ways, at least three different ways. You can use the straight key, which is shown in the picture. You can use an electronic keyer which is a bit fancier. When you're using a computer keyboard, <clears throat> the table on the right, the international Morse code, as you type a letter, it sends out those, those characters, that modulation on your signal. <clears throat> Although some people use that, most CW operators love to copy in their head. They, uh, their experience, they, uh, they have developed this skill to copy Morse code in their head and they can go faster than the computer. <clears throat> Amateur television signals. That's another modulation scheme. <clears throat> the analog fast scan television signal on 70 centimeter band, it's 440 megahertz or so, takes up six megahertz of bandwidth. That's a lot of bandwidth. It's the same as the television broadcasters used to use 20 years ago. And the standard is called NTSC. That refers to the analog fast scan color TV signal transmission. <clears throat> so the old, the old analog television signals were called NTSC. That's a name to remember for the test. Digital modes. <clears throat> Digital modes, usually using a computer and radio to communicate. You tie your computer to your radio as shown in the picture, <clears throat> and then data is sent back and forth. The data sent back and forth can be typed by hand or pre-formatted <clears throat> as information, such as lists. The Red Cross would like to have a list of how many people are in their shelter. Uh, this data can be sent back and forth. <clears throat> Technicians can use data transmission on 219 to 220. It's a dedicated portion of the 220 band that must be 
it must be data only. And uh, it's part of, part of our national network uh, for data. <clears throat> Some digital modes use parity. That's an extra code element used to detect errors in reception. <clears throat> in other words, when the message is sent every thousand characters or so, you can check, check the byte count. If the byte count is correct, then you proceed. If the byte count is incorrect, you get an error message and probably resend. But <clears throat> the extra mode, the extra code element used, it's a bit of overhead, but it ensures that your message got through correctly. Examples of digital mode are packet. That's where they send data in packets of maybe a thousand bytes at a time. <clears throat> IEEE 802.11, 802.11, that is uh, Wi-Fi. Uh, JT65, that is a special digital mode given to the ham radio community by Joe Taylor, JT65, we'll talk about him later. And PSK31, PSK is phased shift keying. It shifts that carrier signal back and forth just by a little bit. And uh, that shift designates a one or a zero. So you can get very, very narrow bandwidth down to 31 hertz. 31 hertz worth of signal shift can be used to transmit messages slowly, but it's still transmits digital messages. And then MFSK, multi-frequency shift keying. Instead of shifting one 31 kilohertz space, you take multiple spaces, multiple frequencies and shift those, MFSK. <clears throat> this is a setup for Packet radio, it's one of the first digital modes, data grouped and sent in packets. You know, packets are smaller bytes, such as uh, 1,000 1, bytes. Every 1,000 bytes, you send the packet and get acknowledgement that it's correct. Packet radio includes a checksum, which permits error detection. It includes a header containing the call sign of the recipient and automatic repeat request in case of an error. If your checksum is not right, you issue an ARQ, automatic repeat request, and the signal, the packet goes out again. It's all automated. APRS. APRS uses packet radio schemes, but it's an automatic packet reporting system, uh, also known as automatic position reporting system. You can tie your radio to a GPS receiver uh, shown in the picture. The blue stuff is part of your globe, your GPS receiver uh, ties to a radio. And because it's, uh, it may be as simple, as simple as a walkie talkie for the radio, or it may be a more powerful base station. The other thing in that picture is a battery the red and black wires go to a battery. So that's what you can use to set up a GPS packet reporting station in your, in your home or in your car. You get real time tactical digital communications along with a map showing location of stations. So again, APRS includes these bold letters and the italicized letters in the questions. We have, uh, at least in Princeton, in the Princeton Red Cross area, we have an APRS setup. And the computer and the screen can show you what you need to know about the uh, station's broadcasting. Could be, could be set up as a map with the, with the global positioning system, or it could be just text messages, either way. 
PSK is phase shift keying, phase shift keying. Um, shifts the phase. As I said, you take your carrier, you move it a little bit this way, a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right, and that contains information by shifting the phase. It's a popular HF digital mode. And PSK31 is a low rate data transition. Uh, the picture shows typing going back and forth, one station to the other. And that is deciphered from this waterfall display below. The information passed back and forth you can probably see the red dot there, the red uh, diamond it says we're following that signal. And that signal, no matter how weak it is, seems to be getting through. One of the other advantages of digital signals, they, uh, they, they can be made to work on very, very weak signals, stuff you'd have difficulty hearing if it was a voice. DMR, DMR is another digital uh, technique. It's very popular uh, with technicians because it occurs on uh, VHF and UHF frequencies that uh, technician privileges include. Uh, it multiplexes because it's digital. Instead of taking up uh, all 12.5 kilohertz, they can have six and a quarter kilohertz kilohertz for one signal and six and a quarter kilohertz for the other signal, it multiplexes two signals on one channel. How do we share those uh, two signals? Well, they, they're shared on virtual channels. In other words, the A channel and the B channel uh, can be broken up into talk groups. One example is in this area is you can have a talk group that's South Jersey you can have a talk group that's North America. You can have a talk group that's the tri-state talk group. You program your radio for that particular group ID in order to join in any one particular group. Uh, weak signal modes, weak signal modes. If you send a signal to the moon and back, unless you've got a giant dish antenna in your backyard, um, your signal is going to be somewhat weak. If you bounce a signal off the moon or any other weak signal, uh, weak signal that you're trying to use to communicate, Joe Taylor has invented a great deal of weak signal, uh, weak signal examples. So WSJT is a weak signal done by Joe Taylor. Uh, he's a Princeton physics professor. He's very well accomplished and he's loaned his, uh, uh, he's loaned his software and his experience to the ham radio community. He's a great friend, he's in Princeton and uh, He's uh, published a lot of uh, software to help us with weak signals. One example is the FT8 uh, is one of his protocols where you transmit messages in 15 second intervals. So <clears throat> a, full trans a full communications might take one or two minutes, but it still gets through no matter how weak it was. There's an FT8, FT4, and there are several other pieces of software where Joe Taylor and his partners have come up with all new uh, digital communications methods. So that's, that's our digital world. Um, one more digital world, and that's mesh networking. Mesh networking uses Wi-Fi frequencies which are typically 2.4 and 5.8. We share those with the, the rest of the world on Wi-Fi. The frequencies on 3.4 gigahertz are, are in between. We 
might use those for for uh, linking various regions of the country to the to the rest of the country, the backbone network. They are in transition right now because the FCC is uh, shifting some of those frequencies around. But uh, our mesh networks are designed to get in on Wi-Fi and go across the country. So this is a project called called the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network, A-R-E-D-N. Uh, it uses Wi-Fi hardware and modified firmware. In other words, if we want to use, instead of half a watt coming out of our, rate, our laptops, if we want to use 10 watts, we're allowed to do that. But we have to modify the, uh, the hardware that is used for mesh networking. Okay. So our next topic is safety concepts. Were there any questions on the previous topics? Okay, we'll move on. Safety concepts, um, because ham radio involves few hazardous things, you really should know about safety concert, concepts to keep yourself and your family safe. General electrical safety, because you're playing with electricity, it's easy to come in contact with dangerous voltages. What's the definition of a dangerous voltage? Anything over 30 volts. You know, if you have a car battery, that's not a dangerous voltage. It can still be dangerous. We'll talk about that later. You had a truck volt battery at 24 volts. It has, it's not a dangerous voltage, but it can still have dangerous currents. But you can get a shock at 30 volts. Um, and actually your body can be, your body can be killed by having a hundred milliamps flowing through the body. Uh, if you have 10 amps flowing through the body, your body can be seriously, seriously fried. So why, why is 30 volts a hazard? This is where they, said that you can start having a problem. You can be electrocuted on 120 volts. You can be electrocuted on 90 volts. If you're standing in water and you get hit by 40 volts, it's not as likely to cause death, but it's still a possibility. If you're sitting on a ladder and you touch something at 48 volts, if you're touching a telephone wire and the phone rings, that goes up to 140 volts. You could fall off the ladder. So dangerous shocks start at 30 volts. The international safety standards start at 30 volts. Anyway, how does current hurt you? It uh, can heat your tissue. Can, uh, heating tissue can give you a burn. It could damage internal organs, disrupts the electrical functions of the cells. It can give you involuntary muscle contractions. Back in the days when electric drills were made of metal, uh, when you are squeezing the, uh, the trigger on an electric drill, you get hit with a shock and you squeeze tighter. It gets worse. You can't let go. So the involuntary muscle contractions also have their they're dangers. So all these, uh, these three things, three, th three issues are what can be on the test. Heating the tissue, disrupting electrical function, and involuntary muscle contractions. Let's see, AC power safety. You know, that's a three prong plug. Three, three wire outlets and plugs are safer than other types. Third wire is called a safety ground. 
The safety ground is often connected using a green wire. If you're an electrician, you know that uh, there's one exception to that, and that could be a bare wire. But anytime you see a green wire, it's supposed to be the safety ground. Don't, don't leave it out. Don't let it break. Good ways to guard against electric shock. Use three wire cords and plugs for all AC equipment. Connect all AC power equipment to a common safety ground and use a circuit protected by a ground fault interrupter. These days it's called a ground fault circuit interrupter, GFCI. Those are required in properly wired houses for any outdoor circuits, any circuits that go to concrete floors, such as the basement or the garage. So those should be there. And if they're not there, consider adding those. Have an electrician do it or learn how to do it yourself. Fuses and circuit breakers. As Alan said, a fuse will interrupt power in case of an overload. Always replace the fuses with the same type and rating. These little glass fuses are not unlimited. You cannot use those on 480 volt circuits. You can only use them at either 32 or 250 volts, as it says on the label. Always replace fuses with the same type and rating. Putting in a 20 amp fuse in place of a five amp fuse can cause a fire from excessive current flow. If you have a short that's always blowing your fuse, don't take out the five amp and put in a 20 amp, and fix the problem instead. You could have a fire. Always include a fuse or a circuit breaker in homemade equipment. Fuses in 120 volt AC circuits are used in the hot lead. Never put a fuse in the common lead or the ground lead. Okay. Another danger in working on equipment. These blue things called capacitors are, uh, they store energy. They can store enough energy to hurt you. So before you work on equipment, disconnect the power. These capacitors can store energy, store charge and shock you even after it's been disconnected. You might disconnect, shut it off, and wait 10 minutes before you go to work on the equipment. Make sure the, the charge that's stored gets bled away until it's safe. Now, the pictures here are blue. When Alan showed pictures of capacitors before, they also had a black one. So that's just a plastic sleeve. It can be blue, it can be black, it can be gray, it can be yellow. But capacitors um, can all store energy and shock you. So they store charge, they can shock you, and it's best to work with one hand. Don't lean on the, uh, don't lean on the metal cabinet and touch the uh, positive end of a capacitor. Don't touch either end of a capacitor until it's been safely discharged. Battery safety, 12 volt batteries, 12 volt lead acid batteries, several hazards. One is explosive gas can collect when they're, when they're being charged. You should not charge them. You should not charge them in the house. If you do charge them in a the house, have a, uh, a vent nearby. Make sure that the gas does not collect there. Gas is hydrogen. Hydrogen is explosive. Shorting terminals can cause burns, a fire, or explosion. So the 12 volts is not a safety hazard by itself, but the immense amount of current, hundreds of amps or thousands of amps on a short circuit can come out of that battery. That can cause burns, fire, or explosion. If you charge them too quickly or discharge them too quickly, they overheat and give off a flammable gas or can explode. So uh, one way not to uh, short a terminal 
is use one wrench at a time, keeping it away from all the, uh, the metal around the car. Take the negative terminal off first, not the positive terminal, take the negative terminal off first. And uh, be careful with any other metal, incidental metal on your hands, like wedding rings. Uh, take the wedding rings off before you go to work on a car battery. You could end up with a uh, severe burn on your finger. All right. If power is out, you can recharge your 12 volt battery by connecting to a car battery and running the engine in a well ventilated area. So many of our radios work on uh, 12 volts. Some people use a 12 volt battery as backup power. These are the hazards to be aware of. Uh, antenna safety. Look for and stay clear of overhead electrical wires. Keep 10 feet of clearance to power lines, even if the antenna should fall. Never use a utility pole as a support. Don't climb the, uh, the power poles in front of your house or anywhere and put your antenna on it. Um, it's not your property and it's not safe for you to put an antenna. Uh, what's wrong with this picture? Too close to the power line to start with. Mm -hmm. Yes. If that tower crumbles, it's a very strong wind. It falls on the power lines and the power lines are connected to your antenna, and go right into your house and can cause a fire or electrocute you either way. It's not good. Uh, how many volts are on the... Uh, on the power lines. Depends dangerous voltages. Yeah, there are dangerous voltages. In every neighborhood, you can either be 120, 240, going to every house, or the lines above that, the lines near the top, are at least 7,200 volts and up. So the antenna could put 7,000 volts into your house which will fry you to a crisp and burn out half of the appliances in your house. So make sure that uh, you're 10 feet away from just about any, any power lines. Position the antenna so no one can come in contact while you're transmitting. RF burns are painful and dangerous. How do you do tower work? You use a gin pole to lift sections or antennas. Now, if you're not using a crane, you certainly can't lift that tower piece over your head unless you have something above that point, like a gin pole. Always use a climbing harness. Everyone, everyone wears a hard hat and safety glasses. Anybody who's working near you should have a hard hat and safety glasses or you keep them out of the area. When the tools fall out of your hand, uh, the people below need to wear hard hats and never climb alone. Uh, you know, if you get stuck in the tower, you fell halfway off the tower, or you fell to the ground, never climb alone. Crank up towers must be fully retracted before climbing. A crank up tower is a telescopic type tower. You can crank it up, crank it down, you must bring it all the way down before you climb it and change antennas. I mean, halfway down means the thing is going to be rickety. And use safety wires in turnbuckles to tension the guy, guy lines to prevent loosening. A turnbuckle could uh, loosen with time. You don't want it to loosen. You put a safety wire in there so it always stays tight. Tower grounding. The tower is a big lightning rod. You know, it may be only 10 feet taller than your house. It may be 100 feet taller than your house. It's still, when the lightning comes, you don't know where it's going to hit, and there's a good chance it's going to hit your tower. You must consult with the local electrical codes. There's a national electrical code updated every three years. 
And at the same time, or three years later, local building codes generally get uh, generally get uh, updated to match the National Electric Code. But in any case, they've determined what's safe. You must, must follow those rules. When the building inspector comes to watch, watch you put up your tower or inspect after you're done, he's gonna to wanna to know these things. Show me the ground rods. Show me the size of the concrete uh, concrete that you put down there. So good practice would be to put separate eight foot ground rods for each tower leg. You've got three tower legs, there should be three ground rods out there. Bond, bond all the metal together, all the legs and rods, bond those together with uh, fat straps or structural steel or structural aluminum. The tower legs are all welded together but uh, they must be all connected together so lightning doesn't come down and start to jump all over the place where it's not supposed to go. You want short and direct connections. The short direct connections avoids lightning jumping out of the way. Avoid a sharp bend. Now, I've been in a lightning lab where you simulate lightning. I've watched. When you run the, the ground wire directly, the lightning tends to follow it. You should put a sharp bend in that so it looks neat. The lightning jumps right off the, uh, the ground strap and goes where it wants. Doesn't follow where you put the ground rod. So avoid sharp bends and all feed line lightning protection should be mounted to a common plate and connected to an external ground. That's what the picture shows, the second picture shows. Uh, all of those antenna connections go through a lightning protection panel and the lightning protection devices, which all get grounded together. Now, RF exposure. When you're using high power, you are required to perform an RF exposure evaluation. Even though VHF and UHF are non-ionizing radiation, um, you must do a safety evaluation. This is something you sign when you sign for your license. You have to sign that, you're, that you will do an RF exposure evaluation to make sure that people don't get microwaved, people don't get hurt by this non-ionizing radiation. If you're in a nuclear plant, if you're in Chernobyl, that's called ionizing radiation. That's different. Our radio waves are non-ionizing. That's on the test. On VHF, a rule of thumb is you can run up to 50 watts at the antenna without performing an exposure evaluation. This is for the purpose of the test. They're constantly updating the rules. So you should check the rules and do your evaluation and know when you're gonna be in trouble. Suppose 50 watts is safe, you wanna put 100 watts out. What do you have to do to make that safe? And a 50 watts, PEP, peak envelope power. All the waveforms we've seen of RF carrier so far <clears throat> show either straight, straight amplitude or moving amplitude. The moving amplitude, the ones that go up and down, you have to measure the peak envelope. That's the peak envelope power. <clears throat> so how do we do that? RF exposure evaluation can be performed <clears throat> by calculation based on the FCC Bulletin 65. FCC Bulletin 65 is an important number to remember. That should be on the test. OET is Office of Engineering Technology. So the FCC, you go to the FCC.gov website, 
you can find bulletin 65 and you follow the steps that they give there. Now they've been updating that for years. Uh, the current supplement, supplement B is what you would have to look for to find out what the latest, uh, latest methods are. But uh, for the test, you just have to know bulletin 65. You can do a calculation based on computer modeling. Uh, good luck with that. You really want to do it according to the FCC's rules. Or you can measure field strength using a calibrated using calibrated equipment. So those are the three methods. Uh, and those are the three methods that the FCC would accept. Now your RF exposure, duty cycle. Duty cycle is the percentage of time the transmitter is transmitting. You know, the picture you see on the uh, right is a very low duty cycle. <clears throat> you transmit only during the blue bars. That's, that's less than 10% of the time. So the duty cycle is also factored into your exposure. It affects the average exposure level. Duty cycle affects the average exposure level. <clears throat> so if theoretically you're transmitting only 10% of the time, then your exposure is reduced to 10%. That's nice, but in general, we transmit about 50% of the time. Somebody talks for a minute, we talk back to them for a minute. So the best you can estimate is 50% of the time. And if somebody is going to talk for an hour, well, you better consider that duty cycle to be 100%. But that's one of the factors affecting the exposure is duty cycle. <clears throat> RF exposure limits. <clears throat> RF exposure varies with frequency. Uh, the human body absorbs more energy at some frequency than others. Uh, the 50 megahertz band has the lowest permissible exposure limit. In other words, our bodies are most sensitive to uh, the 50 megahertz band it has a maximum permissible exposure limit that's tighter than most others. Factors that affect exposure are the frequency and power level of the radiated field, the distance from antenna to person, and the radiation pattern of the antenna. The antennas you see in that picture are cellular antennas. <clears throat> They're on a roof. They're made to shoot their signal outward away from the center of the building. So if those are transmitting, say, 10 watts, uh, they might be multiplied by a factor of 10 because all the energy is focused outwards. So you might have the equivalent radiation of 100 watts if you're within, say, two, two feet. So because the antennas can concentrate your signal, that's what's, uh, <clears throat> that's, that's one of the factors. The distance to the antenna, the radiation pattern of the antenna, and the frequency and power level of the field. To keep exposure safe, you can relocate the antennas, move the antennas up in the sky away from people. You can lower the power level. You can transmit less. If you're operating digital, you can cut the, the duty cycle way down. And anytime you make a change in your station or antenna setup, you should reevaluate. This requirement to keep things safe is ongoing. Anytime you make changes, see that it's safe. You might even want to keep records if you did some calculations or did some studies. Uh, or you quoted some something out of bulletin 65. Uh, keep records. So when the FCC asks to ask for your records, are you really safe and how can you prove it? 
you've got the you've got the data that you examined. I think this is a new topic. Station set up an operation. It's a very good time to see what we do next. Are we ready for lunch? Alan? Yeah, look, it's it's 1120. Um, why don't we go till about a uh, quarter of? Because I think, it, uh, or maybe even 20 of, go another 20 minutes or so. Because I okay. think that what that'll do, that'll take us to 20 of, and then uh, that'll give folks time who haven't registered time to register and get that done before noon and then we'll have lunch and we'll get together maybe at uh, 12 15 12 20 to, to get started again so why don't you go till about uh for another 20 minutes or so okay all right thank you uh, all right now station set up an operation uh, station set up doesn't have to look this complex People have asked me for years, what does my station look like? And I show them, that's what my station looks like. A radio and an antenna. Uh, very often I would uh, unscrew the antenna, screw in the antenna that was in the car and operate this little radio from the car. Little radio is five watts in most areas of New Jersey, five watts is enough to reach many repeaters. Of course, you do better with a mobile radio. Then you're, there's your base station radio at home. You can have all this equipment or you can have less, but it involves all these components, station accessories, dealing with interference, grounding, operating controls, station equipment, troubleshooting, and repair and testing. Okay, station accessories. Your power supply. At 12 volts, you really need heavy gauge wire to avoid the voltage drop that prevents, uh, voltage drop that would cause improper operation. Minimum current capacity. Transmitter efficiency, receiver and control power circuits, control circuit power, regulation and heat dissipation. So all of these facts could be uh, put together in a, uh, in a question. And the idea is, if you need a lot of current, uh, your wires should be heavy duty. At 12 volts, which is most of our equipment, at 12 volts, the, rate, the wires should be much, much heavier than house wiring, because that's 120 volts. They can afford to lose more in your house wiring than you can afford between your power supply and your radio, if it's a high power radio. <clears throat> um, the uh, power supply shown here is a modern high efficiency switching power supply. <clears throat> It's a lot easier to deal with than a 12 volt car battery in your house. All right, headphones. Headphones are used to copy noisy signals. I use that many nights on the shortwave bands. It helps a lot. Microphone, microphone. Uh, microphone includes a rig connector and a push to talk switch sometimes power for the microphone. So your connector brings power into the microphone if necessary, and it includes your push to talk switch. So on your microphone, in general, you need to switch from receive to transmit with a push to talk switch. And sometimes your microphone needs power to work. <clears throat> Computer in the ham shack. You use computers for many things, for logging contacts, for looking up info, for sending and receiving CW, and for generating and decoding digital signals. Um, one of the things you might look up frequently is qrz.com. qrz.com 
is where you look up the call sign and the location of people you've talked to. <clears throat> digital mode accessories. For digital modes, uh, one of the essentials for packet is a terminal node controller. It converts ones and zeros to audio tones. Uh, for RIDI, RIDI is radio teletype uh, or PSK31. <clears throat> Those are some of your digital modes. <clears throat> this can also often be done by the sound card in your computer. So your, the sound card in the computer very often works with uh, the available software so that you don't need, you don't really need a TNC. It's always good to have some sort of interface device in between. It's easier to adjust and connect if you've got all the connectors available in your TNC, rather than try to put all that stuff into your, into your computer USB port. Um, and now it provides audio to the microphone, converts received signals to digital. Uh, often an audio interface is used to adjust the audio levels and provide some ground isolation. So those interfaces, interface functions are provided by a TNC or some other interface device. <clears throat> Interference killers. Uh, ferrite chokes. Ferrite chokes help to minimize some interference. Uh, that's the first step. It's not always enough, but it's usually the first step to get interference uh, from your audio power supply and other cables going to your computer to keep that out of the radio. You can reduce RF flowing on the shield of the audio cables. Uh, so you can see the ferrite chokes in the first picture open and closed. You close them around the wire, or you can actually wrap them if it's uh, a big enough choke, big enough ferrite, you can wrap it two or three times through there to give two or three times the performance reduces the RF flowing on the shields of the cables, the outside of the cables. <clears throat> a low pass filter. Low pass filter is a filter used between the transmitter and, and antenna to eliminate harmonic emissions. They're called low pass because you want to transmit your signal through, but eliminate all the higher frequencies that might jam a television. More interference killers. Here's a smaller, simpler one. <clears throat> Uh, this one you might use at the TV. This doesn't handle the hundreds or thousands of watts that your transmitter might put out, but it's only to protect the TV. You put that in line with your television antenna connection. It's a band reject filter. It rejects any band that's not a television frequency. It helps prevent overload from nearby tra transmitters. Doesn't take out all the signal, but it, it knocks it down far enough to help prevent overload. Again, the uh, term there is called band reject filter. <clears throat> Grounding helps too. Flat strap is best. Connect all equipment to a common ground. You know, in your car, the common ground would be the engine. It might also be the body of the car. But all of those should be bonded together to help give you maximum shielding from any engine noise or engine ignition or computer noise. But flat strap is best. Connect all equipment to a common ground. Car installations, the radio ground can be a connection to your radio chassis or engine block. Oh, I'm sorry. The the car chassis or the engine block. Bond all the grounds together. You know, for example, if your hood, if your hood needs to be grounded, it uh, has nylon rollers 
on the hinge. It has a good deal of paint on it. If your hood needs to be grounded, it's not grounded automatically. You have to add some of that ground where it's, where it's needed. If, if you really need to block some of the engine ignition noise. More call in, car installation tips. Uh, your power supply should go directly to the battery or to a, an unused fuse box terminal. Try not to share it with other terminals. If you go to transmit and it shuts off your, uh, shuts off your engine computer, that's not good. So if you're gonna use the fuse box terminal, make sure it's unused. You're not sharing it with something else. So you don't blow a fuse that's needed for the car. Alternator, noise and whine. You can tell it's an alternator whine because it varies with the RPM of the engine. And for, for alternator noise, filters do help. Picture of one on the right there. Ignition, ignition noise. <clears throat> Ignition noise is pulsing or tick, ticking noise. And the noise blanker in your radio, this thing called NB level is noise blanker. And then there's an NB2. That's the second noise blanker. Many of your receivers can, uh, can help filter out those pulsing noises. <clears throat> Operating controls. Operating controls, RIT is receive incremental tuning. It's used to fine tune the receive frequency, not the transmit frequency, sometimes called the clarifier, helps if a signal, SSB signal is high or low pitched. In other words, if you're talking to somebody whose radio is not exactly on the same frequency as everyone else, you might switch in the RIT when that person is transmitting. If he sounds too high or too low for a normal voice, the RIT helps to shift that. AF, audio frequency gain. It's just a fancy name for the volume control. AGC, automatic gain control, keeps received audio relatively constant. So you don't always have to turn the volume up and down. They're helpful most of the time, not all the time, depending on how crowded the band is, they are helpful. Uh, RF power output is, there's a power control there, sets your power output. Microphone gain sets your microphone gain. It says too high or too low and your signal will be distorted. Or I'm sorry, too high and your signal will be distorted. You wanna make sure that your audio is, is nice if it gets too high and sounds a little distorted, it's going to occupy a lot of bandwidth and annoy everybody else on that band. So you're supposed to keep your signal clean and, and the microphone gain is what helps you do that. And RF gain, RF gain is receiver gain. Received radio frequency gain is called RF gain. Squelch. Mutes the receiver when no signal is being heard. <clears throat> uh, don't set it too high or you'll miss weak signals. Also, squelch is only typically used on FM signals because uh, sometimes the, uh, the noise background overrides what you want to squelch. So, but the, the squelch mutes the receiver where no signal is being received. Don't set it too high or you'll miss the weak signals. That's part of the, uh, the quiz. It doesn't always work, but that's not what the quiz wants to know. Operating controls. The HF transceivers often have a selection of filters permits noise or interference reduction by selecting a filter bandwidth that matches the mode. For example, a filter made for 2400 Hertz would be good for sideband. 500 Hertz would be good for CW. Uh, so 
in your operating controls on your radio, you can select different filters if they're installed. Not, not every radio comes with all these filters installed, but many of the newer radios, they're done, they're included as a function inside. So you can set those frequencies. For example, remember I said that 300 to 3000 is the typical voice range. Well, on sideband, if you cut it back to 2400, <clears throat> you can still hear most of that 3000 Hertz and you don't have to listen to the neighboring frequency where somebody might be splattering a little bit more than 3000 Hertz. And the operating frequency is the big dial. It's set by the VFO knob or by a keypad entry. So in general, the VFO knob is good, but you could also dial in the frequency exactly. If you know it and your radio has a keypad direct entry. Favorite frequencies can be stored in memory for easy access. So that's good. Operating controls. Operating controls <clears throat> on radios. This one here is just about like that one there. I think uh, I have an F6 and that's an F7, very similar controls. Let's see, the offset frequency. When you're operating on a repeater, you have to use an offset frequency. And that is, in this case, is called the shift, offset or shift frequency. Difference between what you transmit and what you receive. The REV control, just, just below that, REV control is a reverse control. You can reverse your frequencies. So you can hear somebody, if you're close enough to somebody, you can hear what he sounds like before he goes into the repeater. You can talk to them back. If you're out of range of the repeater, and both of you are out of range of the repeater, you can talk to each other. One guy goes in the reverse mode, reverses those frequencies, and your transmit and received are reversed, and you don't need the repeater at that point. Uh, station equipment. The basic pieces are a transmitter and receiver. Used to come in two boxes. Nowadays, there's no need to have two boxes. You can put the transmitter and receiver all in one. It's called a transceiver. The antenna is switched between transmitter and receiver internally. Put one antenna in there. When you push to talk, it switches from receive to transmit. <clears throat> RF power amplifier. The increases your power, the RF amplifier can be increased by this blue box. That's the size and shape of most, most VHF and UHF amplifiers. Um, amplifiers for the HF bands very often are bigger than that. There's a lot more switches and knobs. But this is a typical VHF power amplifier. Increases your output from your low power device, like my handheld. And it's on there, there's an SSB, a CW FM switch that sets up the appropriate mode. So you see several switches there. One might be the power to turn on and the other switch would be to set it up, whether you're talking sideband or FM. So as far as equipment goes, you have trans, transmitter, receiver. These are the important details for a receiver. The most important specs are sensitivity, Ability to receive a weak signal. So these are definitions that uh, you match sensitivity to ability to detect a weak signal. That's the correct answer. <clears throat> Selectivity. In order to select the difference between the station you want and the stations that are next door, you need selectivity. Ability to discriminate between multiple signals. <clears throat> A, uh, an option that's typically included in modern radios is a preamplifier. It helps to amplify the weak signals. 
it's installed between the antenna and the receiver. So you can put one <clears throat> external between your antenna and your receiver, <clears throat> but it's, sometimes it's also built into modern radios. The internals of a transceiver include a mixer, converts radio signals from one frequency to the other. <clears throat> Mix the frequency, mix, well, mixes your two frequencies, one that you want and one that you need to shift it somewhere else, somewhere else where the equipment is better able to handle it. An oscillator, an oscillator circuit generates signals at a specific frequency. It can be fixed, it can be variable. You could be shifting the oscillator with the big knob on the front of the radio, <clears throat> but it could be fixed. It could be an oscillator at a specific frequency that doesn't move. <clears throat> modulator, modulator combines your speech or other intelligent signals with an RF carrier. <clears throat> this Modulator is often made of a different type of mixer. So you mix the audio and the RF together and that becomes a modulator. Sometimes that function can be done by a mixer. Transmitter functions. Transmitter function here looks like an AM transmitter. Many of the components are the same. The modulator turns out to be different. <clears throat> so the RF is generated by an oscillator. Oscillator goes into a buffer amplifier to make it more powerful. Your AF audio frequency comes in your microphone, goes to a speech amplifier, goes to a more powerful driver so that when they mix together in the modulator, you come out with an AM signal, um, go through a power amplifier to make sure it's powerful enough to be heard on the other end through your antenna. And there's a diagram of the amplitude modulated signal. Voice modes like SSB, single sideband, and FM need a modulator. A modulator combines the RF carrier and the audio or speech signal, a transverter. A transverter is used to operate on a frequency which a radio was not designed for. <clears throat> uh, a transverter is a device that takes the output of a low powered SSB exciter and produces a 222 megahertz output signal. Now your 28 megahertz SSB exciter can be a say a five watt or a low power signal coming from a 10 meter radio. Now 28 megahertz is 10 meters, which you could have laying around because the sunspots means you don't use it very much anymore. You run that through a transverter and now you're on the 220 megahertz band, 222 megahertz band, which is more useful. It also converts the incoming receive signal, 222 megahertz, to the 28 megahertz signal for your receiver. So the transverter, again, is in the middle sentence, the italics and the bold letters. <clears throat> Some UHF and VHF info. Most operation is using FM and repeaters. CW and SSB are also popular, often for weak signals. <clears throat> weak signals are something that aren't necessarily weak by nature, but because you go so much further with those two modes, you oh. often put up with the, the weaker signal. The device most useful for VHF weak signal communications is the multi-mode VHF transceiver. 
multimode means FM, CW, and SSB all in one transceiver. Handheld transceivers, HTs, have low power, five watts or less, which limits the range. <clears throat> the device that increases the low power from these transceivers is an RF power amplifier. <clears throat> Once again, I've used handy talkies in my cars for years. With an amplifier in the trunk, either it's five watts or 100 watts, depending on how much signal I need at the time. So that device is called an RF power amplifier. Increase the low power to a high power. Troubleshooting common problems. <clears throat> problems are overload, distortion, feedback, and interference. What can cause radio frequency interference? Fundamental overload. Fundamental overload means that there is a signal so close and so strong that it uh, distorts your radio. You can't, uh, can't separate the signals anymore. Uh, <clears throat> harmonics, harmonics. Most ham bands are harmonically related. <clears throat> so you can get interference if you're operating on the 40 meter band and somebody is distorted on the 80 meter band, <clears throat> that's a two to one frequency ratio. Harmonics coming from something usually unintentional, but um, something that should not occur in a clean station, harmonics can cause you interference. And spurious emissions. Spurious emissions come from electronic failures. <clears throat> in somebody's, somebody's transmitter. It doesn't have to be a ham transmitter. It can, can be police transmitter. It can be uh, other, other devices up on the same tower as the repeater you're trying to use. Any of these can cause radio or television inter interference. <clears throat> now, if someone tells you your transmissions are causing interference, you should first make sure your station is functioning properly not causing interference to your own TV and radio. <clears throat> Telephone interference. Telephones often experience interference. Most likely the cause of interference to a non-cordless telephone. So non-cordless telephone, that's a telephone with wires from a nearby transmitter is that the telephone is acting like a radio receiver. Logical first step is to cure all radio interference on a telephone is to install an RF filter at the telephone. Now, now those would be available in some electronic stores. Now, now that Radio Shack is gone, radioshack.com is still available. And of course, there are many other places where you can buy them online. So, Install the RF filter at the telephone. The problem goes away. Your neighbors are happy. Broadcast AM and FM TV interference. So if you're operating your transmitter and a guy with a baseball bat comes through your window and says, stop that, it's likely that you've interfered with, his, uh, with the game he was watching. So. Hey, Pat, hey, Pat. Yes? Question, was this really more true when you're using broadcast TV as opposed to cable, over? Yes, it's, it's mostly. Cable TV is not supposed to pick up outside signals because they use shielded cables. But uh, there are many times when those shielded, ca shielded cables get broken. Many people trying to make illegal taps that the, that, uh, they're trying to share cable signals and it's not done properly. So your signal can get in and out of the cable by some in, incorrect, incorrect hardware that people attach to their cable system. Yeah, the, the, other, the other issue is that a lot of the old uh, well, VCRs and even some of the old cable box converters use channel three as the input to the TV. And channel three is actually very close to the 
our six meter band frequencies. So that's that's where a lot of the interference would come from. But uh, it's true that uh, it's not as prevalent today as it was back when we were we all of our TVs had antennas. <laughs> Okay, I didn't realize that it was close to the six meter band. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, the six meter band is 50 megahertz and channel two is 54 megahertz. Uh, channel three is also just a little bit, a little bit close to, to make sure that uh, all the equipment is going to reject it. It might not reject it because their frequencies are too close. <clears throat> anyway. It's caused by the receiver unable to re reject the strong out of band signals. <clears throat> you can eliminate it by installing a filter to block the amateur signal. That is, uh, you try to put the filter on your neighbor's television, but that takes some diplomacy. First, you should be sure that you don't generate interference. One way to do that is to put a low pass filter on, as we showed earlier. Useful ways to cure the RF interference is make sure all TV coax connectors are installed properly. <clears throat> you could snap on ferrite chokes. You can use low pass and high pass filters. You could use band reject and band pass filters. We saw examples of all those things earlier, but proper TV coax connectors, even from cable systems, must be tight and uh, done properly. Fundamental overload is interference caused by very strong signals injected into a receiver. Uh, so those filters may not eliminate your signal, but they may cut the signal down well enough to solve the problem. Part 15 devices. If a neighbor's device is causing interference, work with them to identify the offending device. Politely inform them about the rules that require to them to stop using the device if it causes interference. And check your station to ensure it meets the standards of good amateur practice. So those are some of the uh, recommended methods in italics that you'll have to put back on the test. You can see the box up top that shows the FCC statement. This device complies with part 15 of the rules, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> Common problems, distorted or noisy audio. Your transmitter might be slightly off frequency. Your batteries might be running low. <clears throat> you may be in a bad location. Garbled, distorted, or unintelligible transmission. When it sounds really bad, that could be due to RF feedback. Your transmitter is feeding microphone, feeding signals back into your microphone. Could be a broken uh, shield connection on the microphone. Could be RF in the shack. In other words, your signal doesn't go straight out to the antenna. A lot of it's lost in the shack next to your microphone. Over deviation on FM. Simple solution for that is to back off the microphone. That often comes when you operate in the car, background is noisier, you shout. You might ask, you might have people ask you to back off the microphone. Uh, noise in digital transmissions causes bit errors. The term called BER, bit error rate, that's the rate at which errors are occurring. You know, you know, the numbers look very, very small. If you have a bit error rate that's a very small number, it may be tolerable, but anything approaching 1% and that uh, causes bit errors, causes slow transmissions or failure to connect. High pitched whine, noise from the vehicle's electrical system, usually the alternator. If it varies with the speed of the engine, the alternator is the likely cause. Uh, sometimes that can be fixed. Sometimes the alternator should be replaced. You know, it's, it's on its last legs, 
Sometimes it needs to be replaced to eliminate that wine. Uh, using a multimeter or DMM, DMM stands for digital multimeter. Multi because it has a voltmeter, an ohmmeter, and an ammeter. Uh, digital multimeter, instead of a needle, it has digits. Measure voltage and resistance. Uh, they are common use. To measure voltage, the voltmeter is placed in parallel with the circuit. And shown in the middle picture to the right. Make sure that the voltmeter leads are rated for the voltage you are measuring. Uh, a good set of leads, not necessarily the, uh, the free meter you get from Harbor Freight, but a good set of leads <clears throat> are rated for about 600 volts. You don't try to measure somewhere in your transmitter 6,000 volts. <clears throat> the, the leads must be rated properly or you could get a shock, you could uh, do other damage. Uh, and to measure current, the amp ammeter must be placed in series with the circuit. You have to break the circuit, insert the ammeter, and make sure that your connections are strictly for the ammeter. You can see the difference between the two different connections there. One is for volts, one is for amps. You have to be hooked up differently. <clears throat> and if you do it wrong, you blow the fuse or burn up the meter. So measure current is not done as often. So you got to be careful. <clears throat> Ohm meter. Uh, Ohm meter is used to measure resistance. Make sure that the circuit is not powered. You have to measure the resistance of a dead circuit. No power attached, you also can damage your meter. Attempting to measure voltage on the resistance setting might damage the meter. When measuring resistance, an initial low reading that slowly increases means that the circuit contains a large capacitor. <clears throat> In other words, whenever you're taking resistance readings, you would like it to stand still. If it increases, keeps moving, it might be that there's a capacitor in the circuit that you're trying to measure. <clears throat> and soldering. Soldering is a good skill to have. Solder repairs a lot of connection, connectors and connection joints. Uh, rosin core solder <clears throat> is best for radio and electronic use. When you do that, the joints should be shiny and smooth like the green check mark shows. Dull or grainy surface is a characteristic of a cold solder joint. Cold solder joint means that uh, before, the cyst, before the thing cooled down smoothly, you might have moved it. You might not have had enough heat to get a smooth flow to begin with. And that cold solder joint, grainy surface is likely to break loose again. It's not a good connection. Uh, now this is basic hand soldering. You see someone using solder in his bare hands, you really should use gloves, rubber gloves, plastic gloves, when you're soldering with lead. Most of the solder that we like to use is lead. Lead is easier to use, but whatever metals are in the solder, you don't want them, you don't want them on your hands and you certainly don't want to eat after you've been using this. So there are several grades of solder. Most of them are non-lead solder these days. The non-lead solder is a little bit more difficult to use. But in any case, the questions on the test say to use rosin core solder, to use a dull or grainy surface is a characteristic of a cold solder joint. So these are the correct answers. Exactly how you use Non-lead solder is for another day. All right, and Joe, yeah, you're good. You're on slide 129 now, you're good to go. Okay, okay. So we're gonna talk uh, about operating procedures and uh, advance. First, the 
<clears throat> duplex and simplex terms. Duplex communications refers to uh, transmit and receive on two different frequencies where the uh, uh, transmitter on the left would talk to the receiver on the right on one frequency and the receiver on the right would talk back to the receiver on the left on another frequency. Uh, this is gonna be important in, a, in terms of repeater operation. Uh, simplex communications refers to uh, transmit and receive on the same frequency. One guy transmits, the other guy listens and then they reverse the process on the same frequency. And on uh, two meters, the national simplex frequency is 146.52. And uh, on 450, the 70 centimeter band, uh, 446.0 megahertz. Uh, those are important to remember. Okay, as far as some common uh, uh, transmitter controls on VHF, UHF uh, radios, the carrier squelch, which mutes the audio until an RF signal comes up of sufficient amplitude to uh, uh, open the squelch and it eliminates the uh, requirement to turn the background noise or turn a volume control down. Essentially the volume control would uh, uh, be turned up. When there's no carrier, you don't hear the background noise. When there's a carrier, you hear the, uh, the voice transmission. The other one common is the uh, microphone gain, which changes the amplitude of the modulating signal. In the case of FM, it sets the deviation. And if the deviation is increased, the signal occupies uh, more bandwidth. Repeater operation. Normally repeaters are located very high. And of course they're uh, either on mountaintops or tall buildings and uh, tall towers. The purpose is to extend the line of sight uh, between two uh, stations located on the ground, whether they're mobile or handheld. And looking at the diagram, you have a repeater input where you talk to the repeater on one frequency. It repeats what you just uh, transmitted at the same time to the uh, on a lower frequency in this case. <clears throat> and uh, both the uh, input and outputs on the mobile need to be on the same uh, channel pair. So you listen on one frequency, it rebroadcasts on the output. Uh, your radio must transmit on the input and it must receive on the output. And the difference between the input and output frequencies uh, is referred to the split. Okay, S station classes that could retransmit signals automatically include the repeaters. Uh, auxiliary stations, which are uh, stations that would uh, provide uh, in the case of a repeater with multiple receive locations, they would provide the link back to a central unit. That if you're, you do have a multiple uh, input system, it, uh, the system will determine where your, uh, which receiver you're using has the uh, strongest signal and puts that back out on the uh, common output frequency. And uh, space stations, uh, satellites. Common splits for the two meter band are 600 kilohertz. There are others, but the most common is uh, 600 kilohertz. And uh, on uh, 450, the 70 centimeter band, uh, five megahertz. Something to be aware of are uh, repeaters that are actually sharing input and output splits with others that are located uh, tens to hundreds of miles away, but could cause uh, co-channel interference. So we use what's called the continuous tone coded squelch system uh, or a digital coded squelch to uh, set up one repeater system so that it doesn't interfere with the other one. So there's subaudible tones that are set with your voice to open the squelch and also referred to uh, as PL tones, which is a trade name that Motorola used. You may hear the term quiet channel that was used by uh, I think RCA at one point, but uh, the PL is, is most commonly uh, used. And the reason why you can hear a repeater but may not be able to open it is because of uh, an improper transceiver offset. The uh, uh, continuous tone coded squelch may be the wrong frequency. I believe there are around 50 of those that are, that are used and uh, a lot of the equipment is, uh, it's a menu setup. 
where the repeater may require a digital tone sequence for access, which is similar where you use a digital encoding scheme to open the squelch. And if a signal is not strong enough to open the squelch, you might be able to hear it by listening on the repeater's input frequency. That's uh, in a uh, one of the test questions. And if your signal is breaking up, you may be again over deviated or talking too loudly and you can remedy that with a uh, reduced mic gain setting. Okay, repeater operation to uh, strike up a conversation. The term CQ is not uh, really used in in repeater work, uh, you just drop your call sign and indicate that you're listening. Uh, for instance, uh, W2AEW listening. And uh, if you some, if somebody hears that, they'll return their call sign uh, with yours or call you and, and return their call sign. And if you hear somebody call, drop their call, you return with uh, their call sign and identify uh, your transmission with your call sign. Okay, pretty straightforward. In HF operations, CQ is generally used, and good practice is always listen first. You don't want to step on somebody else who may be using that frequency. After you listen for a minute or two, uh, make a transmission and ask if the frequency is in use. And if it is, somebody will come back and say, yeah, it's in use, and you end up moving off. And you also want to make sure that you're uh, operating in a band that's uh, uh, assigned to your class of, of license. Uh, responding to a CQ signal, just transmit the other station's call followed by your own call. Station identification is always, ident is always required, even when you're testing. Uh, and you want to identify at least every 10 minutes while you're operating and at the end of your, uh, your conversation. And it's normally, this is and your call sign. Technicians can operate uh, CW in 80, 40, 20, 80, 40, 15, and 10 meters. And uh, you'll hear common uh, Q signals that were actually a, a holdover from, from the Morse. Uh, QRM indicates uh, you're getting interference. QSY indicates you're changing frequency. Uh, there are others. But uh, and are, they are spoken. They are used as, as spoken shorthand as well as on uh, Morse code. So it's common to hear those. General guidelines, a band plan is uh, voluntary for different modes and activities in the amateur band. Uh, the bar below is a layout of the two meter band that shows uh, CW down in the very lower portion, a single side band. Some miscellaneous uh, modes, APRS that was mentioned previously. Uh, repeater inputs and repeater outputs with a digital packet in there as well. And common practice is to uh, maintain minimum power necessary to carry out the desired communications. You're allowed to 1500 watts on VHF and above 200 watts on uh, HF uh, and with a technician class uh, license. Okay, and you wanna make sure that your signal is clean. If somebody reports that you're causing some splatter uh, you want to check your transmitter for the proper frequency or for uh, uh, spurious emissions caused by uh, overmodulation is a good place to start. If you unintentionally cause interference, then identify yourself and move off to a different frequency. The other tool to use is the phonetic alphabet when trying to convey uh, alphabets and, and numbers. This is actually the uh, ITU alphabet. It's uh, encouraged by the FCC. It's also uh, used by the aviation people to, uh, uh, in the spoken word, uh, convey the, the uh, letters of the alphabet and numbers. Public service and emergency, and uh, emergency use and non-emergency use. The hams are really uniquely qualified to help out in a lot of events. Uh, FCC rules still apply when using the uh, amateur radio for the public service uh, purposes. Except, and you have to abide by those, <laughs> except when there's a, uh, an imminent danger to uh, safety of human life or uh, property damage, and you uh, can use any means necessary for the essential communications to, to occur. Two uh, services that the amateurs can participate in related to emergency services are the RACES, Amateur Service 
which is the Radio Amateur Civil Emergency Service. They're amateur radio stations that are used to communicate with uh, civil defense officials. And the uh, Amateur Radio Emergency Service, both RACES and, and uh, ARES can provide emergency uh, communications. Uh, the primary difference is one is uh, related to the government activities and uh, ARES is an ARRL sponsored uh, uh, organization. Uh, they're both common to uh, form nets uh, orchestrated by a net control station. Messages passed during these operations are called traffic and common uh, mode of operation is to check in with your call sign, remain on frequency in case you're uh, re re required, your services are required by the net control station. And just be aware that you are, uh, you have the uh, message handling and traffic, uh, national traffic system. There are both uh, formal and informal networks. It's most important when you're going to pass a message to uh, pass the message exactly as either it's written or spoken or as you receive it and always use the phonetic al alphabet when, when appropriate. The uh, formal messages consist of a preamble, uh, which is uh, usually a, a check of the number of words that are uh, contained in the message, the address, who it's going to, the text of the message, and followed by the signature. <clears throat> Again, with the uh, National traffic system preambles used to track the uh, message system as it passes through the, uh, the network. The check is the number of words or words equivalent, addresses uh, who it's going to, text and, and signature we've talked about. Uh, net operations, all net communications are generally handled through the net control station and uh, only transmit when directed by the net control station. If you have something that's of a emergency in nature, uh, get their attention by, by speaking the words priority or emergency followed by your uh, call sign. Amateur satellite activities. Uh, well, uh, amateur satellites are, are in orbit. They have uh, uplink and downlink frequencies that are uh, often in different bands. In what's referred to as the UV mode, uh, the link from your transmitter up to the satellite is usually on the 70, 70 centimeter band, in the 420 to 450 region, and the downlink back to you is in the two meter band. Uh, you need uh, license privileges to transmit on the uplink frequency, but you can, can listen to the uh, downlink uh, frequencies with uh, receivers that are, are capable of that. Most run in FM mode. Some operate in uh, single sideband CW or data modes. A satellite beacon has got, uh, is normally a transmission that's on the uh, satellite that uh, contains information about the satellite, health and status information in particular. And again, anybody can receive this telemetry. What you need to be aware of though, when operating satellite uh, communication systems or the frequency change caused by Doppler, the observed change in frequency is going to uh, uh, be noticed due to the motion between the satellite and uh, you. Uh, as the satellite is coming towards you, the frequency will go up. And as it's leaving you, the frequency will appear to go down. Uh, Spin and fading is caused by uh, slight rotations of the satellite and the antenna system on board. Those are uh, both questions that uh, you may, may see. When operating with satellites, you don't want to use too much power because you can block access uh, to the satellite by others. And you need to keep an eye on your signal strength. It should be the uh, same as the uh, downlink that you're uh, receiving from the beacon. Uh, FM digital packets commonly used. Sometimes it's a store and forward system. Sometimes it's uh, real time. And uh, there are satellite tracking programs available uh, on the internet or maps that show the real time position, uh, time, azimuth, uh, elevation at the start and, and the past details. 
and uh, as well as frequency, the apparent frequency of the transmissions that includes the Doppler and uh, the orbital elements, the Keplerians uh, as input to those things. Space Station has got uh, some amateur equipment on it. Any technician class license can make contact with those folks when they're in view. Uh, contact uh, is on both the uh, 450 and two meter bands, 70 centimeters and, and two meters. And uh, the space station is, is considered a low earth orbit uh, satellite. Contesting. Uh, Normally, contests are run for specific time periods. Sometimes it's back-to-back day-to-day. Sometimes it's across uh, weekends, uh, depending on what particular uh, contest you're working. A very popular one is where everybody takes their uh, normal uh, homebound stations and goes to the field or goes, goes to the field in uh, field day, which is the, uh, usually the last weekend in June. Uh, good practice during contesting is to send a minimum uh, required of it, required information that the uh, contest uses. Uh, some of them require signal strength, some of them require contest number, it depends on the contest. And you want to be uh, mindful of others on the band whenever you uh, try to join a contest. Uh, a lot of the contests use grid location, which is uh, a system that divides the world up into, uh, uh, I think it's 340 major grids and then 100 minor grids in each of the locations. And then those uh, minor grids have sub subgrids. You'll normally hear grids referred to by two letters and two numbers. Uh, and if you take a close look at the map here, you see that Northern New Jersey is mo mostly in grid number FN20, Fox November 20. More fun activities, uh, special event stations, which are generally given a, a letter with a number and a following letter, three digit call sign. Uh, Whiskey to Papa would be the uh, special event station that uh, one of the local radio clubs uses for the annual uh, Battle of Princeton special event station. And uh, that's normally in a December time frame for, for a couple of days. And often you'll find special event stations for uh, other uh, events that are significant to the amateur radio community. And on that on that topic, uh, Joe, uh, for any of those, any of you that uh, may have watched or enjoy the uh, show Last Man Standing, know that uh, the principal in that show is, uh, is a ham and it's kind of featured in the, in the show. The show is is entering or is finishing up its last season, and actually the producer of the show is actually helping to organize a week long special event where there'll be stations around the world that are using KA six LMS as a last man standing special event that you're encouraged to go listen to and and work. So it's just kind of so these special events could really involve almost anything. Yeah, very good. Thanks, thanks, Alan. Yeah, the. Uh... Other activity that uh, sometimes is, is held is a fox hunt where a low power transmitter is hidden in some, some location and makes periodic transmissions. And uh, par participants try to find them using direction finding techniques and they can vary from everything from the uh, directional antennas that you see here that are used for uh, homing types of direction findings all the way up to uh, multiple element arrays that have a uh, uh, commutated type direction finding system that uh, would display a line of bearing on a uh, computer screen. And uh, you can uh, actually locate, locate those stations with a fairly good degree of accuracy using the, uh, the directional antennas and the homing technique. In addition, just be aware that there are some internet uh, activities. The uh, Internet Repeater Linking Project, IRLP, uses a, a voice over the internet to link multiple repeaters together. And you could uh, talk to a repeater here in, uh, in New Jersey, uh, linked via the internet to someone out in, uh, on the West Coast. Repeater directory will list the active nodes as well as uh, 
the online lists and the information. One of the uh, uh, methods used for uh, to dial up uh, a node from your from your from your radio to the repeater input. Some radios on the back of the microphone will have a touch tone keypad, keypad, which are which is what's known as the DTMF or dual tone multi frequency keypad. Those tones are transmitted to the uh, repeater. The repeater and controllers will respond to those those tones and uh, make complete the dial up for you. Uh, Echo Link is another organization that uh, links repeaters. You can actually come in from your uh, computer, uh, but you need, need to register your call sign and provide a proof of license before the Echo Link folks will give you your uh, access uh, authorization. And uh, Gateway is the name that uh, is referred to the station that links the other stations to the uh, to the internet. Okay, moving on to the, uh, any questions so far on the operations? All right, moving on to uh, the rules and regulations. Uh, amateur activity in this country is regulated by the uh, Federal Communications Commission, also enforced by those guys. And uh, it's referred to as part 97 of the rules and regulations applicable to amateur radio use. And one purpose, and you might see this on the test as well, is advancing the skills and the technical communications phases of the radio art. Okay, and the definition of an amateur radio station is a uh, station in the amateur radio service consisting of the apparatus necessary for carrying on radio communications. Definition of a space station is anything that's flying higher than uh, 50 kilometers above the earth. Uh, the beacon is an amateur radio station. It's transmitting comms for the purposes of uh, propagation or related experimental activities. They can be on both satellites and located on the ground in just about any band, whether it's uh, HF, VHF, or uh, UHF. And uh, realize that frequency coordination for the use of those subbands is uh, normally done by a volunteer frequency coordinator. And the volunteer frequency coordinators are selected by the amateurs in the local region, and they recommend the transmit receive channels uh, primarily for the purpose of uh, uh, mitigating interference between other other users. Repeaters, we talked a little about repeaters. The formal definition there is an amateur station that simultaneously retransmits the signal of another amateur station on a different frequency. And the aux, auxiliary station uh, definition as well below. Interference, something that uh, is never permitted and you wanna make sure that uh, we're good neighbors and don't interfere with other licensed uh, interfere uh, other licensed users, other amateurs. Uh, and the definition of the harmful interference is right up there on the screen. It seriously degrades, obstructs, or, or uh, regularly interrupts the radio communication service. Uh, if uh, the intentional causing of interference is grounds for the re revocation of licenses, uh, commission can impose some fairly hefty fines and uh, in some cases imprisonment if uh, you're found to be causing uh, intentional interference. International Telecommunications Union, FCC is in the, uh, in the US, the rest of the world has their own organizations and everybody coordinates their efforts through the International Telecommunications Union, which is a UN agency uh, they do have an office in, in New York at the uh, UN. The uh, primary office is in uh, Geneva, I believe. The Earth is divided in three regions. Uh, North American stations are in region uh, two. And again, the uh, ITU deals with uh, worldwide organizations and FCC uh, operates within their framework. When you, uh, you get your license, you're gonna have some privileges in the uh, bands that are up here on the screen. 
be able to use uh, Morse on uh, 80, 40, and 15 meters, uh, CW again on 10 meters, and some limited foam privileges. You're limited to uh, uh, 200 uh, watts maximum peak envelope power on the uh, uh, 10 meter band. Above 50 megahertz, uh, you have all amateur privileges, everything that uh, that anybody in any other class uh, has, with the exception of the few novices that are left, uh, you can uh, pretty much operate with up to uh, 1500 watts PEP. The uh, questions relating to the frequency bands, uh, 52525 is within the uh, six meter band. It's uh, also the uh, uh, simplex uh, calling frequency on six meters. Two meter band is uh, what you're using when you're transmitting on the 146.52 uh, national simplex frequency. Uh, 433.50 is authorized up on 23 centimeters, 1296. And uh, 1.25 meters is uh, 223. Uh, and again, you have uh, 200 watts on the assigned portions of the HF uh, band and 1500 watts above 30 megahertz. Again, in some, some cases, we have primary and secondary users in the amateur uh, world. Uh, amateur radios are uh, shared like uh, with commercial operators in the 70 centimeter band and the uh, I'm sorry, in the uh, 23 centimeter band. Uh, sometimes we're the primary users like in the uh, 70 centimeter band. When we're secondary users, you gotta make sure that we are, are not causing uh, harmful interference to primary licensees. If you do find you're uh, interfering with one of the radio location services uh, outside the US, you need to stop uh, operating and take action. Some of the subbands that uh, we need to be, be aware of is that uh, in six meters and two meters, uh, CW operation is only allowed in uh, the first uh, 100 kilohertz or 0.1 megahertz of those bands. And uh, some restricted mode subbands for the tech, technician class license are found on six, two and uh, 1.25 meters. When you uh, find a fr frequency that's clear, you want to check and make sure that you're not operating too close to the band edge. And the reasons for that are uh, your voice transmissions are going to be uh, wider sometimes than, uh, than just a kilohertz or two away from the band edge. And you don't want any energy to spill out outside the band. And uh, you want to allow for transmitter uh, drift and as well as the uh, calibration, any calibration error you may have in your transmitter frequency display. Okay, licenses and, uh, and operating. This is uh, a picture of what the, the current license uh, looks like on a wooden plot. Uh, call signs in the uh, US or one or two letters followed by a sing single number, which is then followed by one, two or three letters. Uh, one by two would be uh, Whiskey Two Zulu Quebec. The two by one would be Whiskey Alpha Three November. Uh, one by threes and two by three, so on. Vanity call signs are available to any uh, license class amateur, but they need to match the format for your uh, class of a license. Uh, Currently, the only new classes of license that are being issued are technician, general, and extra class licenses. Special events call signs we just talked about. And clubs. In order to be considered a club, you must have at least uh, four members uh, in the particular organization uh, to apply for a, a club license. Uh, and that is a, a current test question. Uh, individual logging is no longer required for uh, each one of your transmissions, 
but you need to keep your records if you're uh, required to do a uh, RF uh, safety survey, you really need to keep, uh, keep that around, as well as keeping your current uh, mailing address uh, up to date. Uh, failure to do that will uh, result in a suspension or uh, revocation. The FCC will take action if the correspondence uh, that they send you for whatever reason uh, may be a, a return to sender. You can operate as soon as your, your name and call sign appear in the FCC's Universal Licensing System database. Uh, so if you take the test today, as soon as you check on the internet, the, uh, your call sign has been issued, uh, you can use that when it appears in the uh, Commission's ULS database. The license is good for uh, 10 years. Uh, renewal grace period is two years, so after it expires, you have up to two years to actually renew the license, but you can't transmit during the uh, grace period. And you cannot transmit until the, the renewal shows up in that database. Okay, operating outside of the, uh, of the country, sometimes uh, foreign companies will allow it. Some countries have reciprocal agreements. The example there is, is Germany, but uh, you need to check with uh, uh, the authorities in the country for uh, local restrictions. Uh, operating on international waters, maritime mobile, uh, you, legally you can operate on any vessel documented or registered in the U.S. when they're in international waters. Uh, this graphic happens to show a uh, cruise vessel and what I would suggest you do is check with your cruise operator if you're planning on, on taking, the, uh, taking your license and equipment on a commercial uh, cruise vessel. Some cruise operators uh, are amateur friendly some are not, so uh, you really want to check with the, uh, the cruise operator. Uh, FCC authorized and prohibited transmissions. Uh, common sense, good, uh, good operating practice. Uh, you want to, want to not have the obscene or indecent words or language. And it, what's expressly permitted is music, except when it's incidental to the authorized retransmission of manned spaceflight going to wake up some astronauts with a uh, with a song and uh, you're going to retransmit that as a public service uh, or, or some other reason uh, you can retransmit the uh, space communications with the music and unpublished codes or ciphers uh, you can use codes and ciphers as long as they are published and well known uh, the only exception to this is when you're transmitting uh, space commands or transmitting commands to a space vehicle or a radio controlled uh, model or craft. Uh, no communications with any country whose uh, uh, government has notified the ITU that it, it objects to such communications. Uh, you cannot use the station to uh, make money or be compensated with the exception of uh, teachers or, or supporting a teacher incidental to uh, classroom instruction uh, or the occasional notification that you have equipment for sale. Some, some organizations have periodic uh, online swap, uh, swap sessions, but uh, essentially making money from, uh, from the amateur licenses is, is prohibited. And no broadcasting and for, for the purposes of this session, the broadcast is defined as transmissions intended for reception by the general public. Uh, the only uh, exception to that is uh, relations to safety of uh, human life. Uh, or, or when you transmit uh, a code uh, practice section, information bulletins or transmissions, these are primarily for the uh, W1AW uh, ARRL uh, folks. What is allowed? Anything that's incidental to the purposes of the amateur radio service, remarks of a personal character, brief transmissions for the purposes of making your equipment adjustments, but uh, just about uh, everything of a, of a general conversational nature is, uh, is allowed. Control operator. 
station is never operated without a control operator. And who can that be? Well, it's a person who is the uh, primary station licensee and uh, your grant appears in the uh, ULS database. And, uh, or you're authorized uh, as an alien reciprocal operator. That would be a visiting amateur that is uh, recognized uh, by the, uh, the US to operate here. And it's usually the uh, station licensee. Uh, need to pay attention to the class of control operator privileges. Uh, this means that a technician class uh, oper class licensee cannot be a control operator in the extra portion of the spectrum. It's uh, reserved for extra licensees. Uh, you need to have your license uh, or be a control operator in a part of the spectrum where your license is valid. Control operator point is required only for the, for transmitting. You can receive uh, as you like, but it's only for, for the transmit side. Uh, you can be designated by the uh, station licensee and both the control operator and station licensee are equally responsible for the proper operation of the equipment. This could be, case of this would be a uh, an operator that's using a repeater where uh, you as the uh, uh, user are equally uh, responsible as the owner of the repeater for the proper operation of the equipment. The control points defined as the location at which the control operator function is, is performed. Local control, so you're, you are co-located with the transmitting equipment. Okay, remote control would be a control operator, not at the station, but can indirectly manipulate the operating adjustments of a station, such as operating over the internet, being able to shut the repeater down if something goes awry with the repeater itself from, from a remote location. Uh, control operators required to be present at the control point, either indirectly manipulate the controls or locally controls. And uh, automatic control is when a repeater repeater when the control operator is not present at the control point. The only permissible type of the control operator to be at the location other than the control point. Station identification. Again, every 10 minutes and at the end of the contact uh, in English or by uh, and by uh, voice in the case of phone or Morse in the case of uh, uh, of any other other emissions class. Uh, use of the phonetic alphabet is encouraged. Uh, the only time you don't have to uh, identify is when you're transmitting signals to a, uh, a model craft for control purposes. Uh, tactical call signs, like uh, if you're supporting a walkathon or a race, uh, race operator are okay, but you still have to give your call sign ID every uh, 10 minutes. Uh, more on station identification. This map shows the uh, ARRL call district map, uh, which were the original FCC uh, call districts. Uh, and normally what happens with your license is that you're assigned a number with your initial license will have a number in the district that uh, you're operating. Uh, you can change that with a vanity uh, call sign. Uh, just don't conflict with any other FCC identifiers or uh, foreign country call sign pre prefixes. Third party comms, that's uh, communications on behalf of someone other than a licensee, like a uh, friend using your station to uh, the talk. It's legal between any two stations in the US. If you go overseas, you may have some restrictions on third party communications. Just make sure that the uh, uh, other country does have a third party agreement with the US. Okay, again, station records have to be available uh, to the FCC at any time. And that's, uh, that's the end of the show. Well, if you made it this far, I hope you enjoyed uh, that ham radio review class or the ham cram, and it helped prepare you to take your own technician class license. Uh, again, please, uh, if you like the video, Give me a thumbs up. 
Uh, hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so already. And thanks again as always for watching.